And we got a little bit more to finish uh, in unit 20, not too, too much, but just a little bit. And while I'm getting myself set up, I want you guys to tell me in a private chat, private chat, when we talk about lead-based paint, the lead-based paint addendum applies to any home built prior to what year? Private, goodness, you were ready for me. <laughs> Some of you are like super fast. When we talk about lead-based paint, I have a form, a lead-based paint addendum, and that form applies to any home property built prior to what year? You're telling me in a private chat what you think that year is. I'm getting myself. I'm seeing lots of things coming in the chat. And the year that we need to know for lead-based paint, not just for your test, but for your career as well, is 1978. So anything built prior to 1978, guys, I'm not telling you, this house was built in the 60s, it's got lead in it. What we're saying is because it was built prior to 1978, it may have lead in it. There's no promise, there's no guarantee, it's meant to serve as a warning. So if we look and learn test pass, and we're under the unit 20 material, we have a form, uh, one of our first forms, and this is our lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazard addendum. So first off, another private chat time. We're just jumping to throwing you guys right in. Who can remind me one word in a private chat, what the word amendment means? What is an amendment? If you amend something, what are you doing? If you amend something. Welcome, good morning. Good morning. So if you amend something, we can remember what an amendment is. An amendment is a change. If you amend something, you're changing it. We first met the word amendment in our zoning and we talked about a zoning amendment. So what's a zoning amendment? It's a change in the zoning. Now we're gonna get more, we're gonna see amendment again uh, when we start talking about our forms, but I think some confusion is the difference in an amendment and an addendum. So that's why I want to start with a refresher about what an amendment is. Everybody good with me so far? An amendment is a change. The form I'm looking at though is an addendum. When you guys see the word addendum, I would like you to see the word add. An addendum adds to and becomes part of the offer to purchase and contract. So lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazard addendum attaches to our offer. An amendment changes our contract, an addendum adds to our offer. Now we're gonna get more into this. We got a whole, we got two units dedicated to contract and contract law. So we'll see all this again, but I think it's important that we know the form that we're looking at. So we got our lead-based paint, lead-based paint hazard addendum. We put the property address here, identify your seller and your buyer. And it tells us this addendum is attached to and made part of the offer to purchase and contract between the seller and the buyer for this property. I'll let you guys read this. You guys, I don't need to read to you. You guys can do this. Um, you don't need to you know, study this form. Don't spend all your study time on this. But I do think it's good that you guys are familiar with it. I do think it's good that you guys have a gist of what it says. So remember when we talked about lead-based paint last week, uh, we suggested that we provide our buyer with that protect your family from lead in your home EPA pamphlet. So the addendum reminds us uh, to get that in our buyer's hands. Here's a lead warning statement. Um, every buyer on which a residential dwelling was built prior to 1978 is notified that such property may present exposure to lead from lead-based paint in the home that may affect young children um, at risk of developing lead poisoning. So it's meant to serve as a warning. If your buyer's gonna buy a home built prior to 1978, they should be encouraged to learn more about it. What are the dangers of potential lead in their home? If your tenant is gonna rent a home 
prior to 1978. They should be encouraged to learn more about it. It's about educating the consumer, okay? Uh, we go on, this form serves partly as a seller disclosure. The seller needs to disclose to the buyer if they are aware of any presence of lead in the home. Remember we said the other day that if it's a do-it-yourselfer, if it's a somebody that painted themselves, they may not know, they may not know that you can have it tested. You know, when you go to Lowe's to buy paint, it doesn't tell you to have your paint tested, does it? So you may or may not know if you're a do-it-yourselfer. Uh, however, if you've had contracted work, it's safe to say that they chipped off some of the paint, sent it in, had it tested to see if there was lead in it. So once the seller learns that there is lead in their home, they have to disclose that. So what the sellers disclose to buyers, they know of lead-based paint in the home or they have no knowledge. Everybody see that? They have to select one or the other. And if they do have any reports and records available, the seller needs to provide them. So again, the seller has to disclose. They have provided the buyer or they have no reports to provide to the buyer. Again, the seller is just disclosing to the buyer what they know, if anything, about the presence of lead in the home. Guys, please remember, you can't disclose what you don't know. Fair enough? You don't know what you don't know, right? So if you don't know it, you can't disclose it. So if they know, they need to disclose. Um, the buyer needs to acknowledge, they're gonna initial that they've received anything, reports and records that the seller provided. They're gonna acknowledge that they received that pamphlet that you, their agent, gave to them. So if you don't give them that pamphlet, don't ask them to initial this. You don't, everybody with me? You only ask them to initial this if you provide that to them. And then the buyer has the opportunity to have, the, have it tested uh, as part of their inspection period when they're under contract. We will talk all about their inspection period when we get to units nine and 10. Um, our forms, this is, since this is our first introduction to forms, our forms are provided by the North Carolina Association of Realtors and the North Carolina Bar Association. So the North Carolina Association of Realtors is the state level of the National Association of Realtors. Remember, we met NAR back in unit one. We said once you join NAR, then you become a realtor. So NAR also has state levels. Ours, of course, is the North Carolina Association of Realtors. And NCAR, as we like to call it, because we'll make an acronym out of anything that we can in this industry. So NCAR provides us our forms that we can use, our standard forms. NCAR joined forces with attorneys. That's who the North Carolina Bar Association is. So the forms that we use were legally drafted. They were created by an attorney provided to us as realtors uh, to use. If you are a realtor, if you are a member of the National Association of Realtors, you can use forms that rock that capital R. I think that's what the public recognizes. Have you guys ever seen that before? Somewhere that capital R, that's what the public recognizes. Um, if you're not a realtor, you can't use these forms, right? Only members, only those that are. We'll also see on all of our forms our equal housing opportunity logo. Uh, again, I got a whole unit dedicated to fair housing. So we'll talk about fair housing in unit 19. And then it tells us the form number, which we don't need to know the numbers, but there's a lot of forms out there. So in time, as you go on, you might learn some of these numbers, more the ones that you use the most, you know, because it might help you easier to find it. Um, and then the revised date, whenever the most current is. So that's kind of that. Uh, the rest of this form, buyer signs on the left, seller signs on the right. Again, we're not saying your home has lead in it. We're saying because of the year that it was built, you may want to have it inspected. It may have lead in it. Questions or comments on our first form? Lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazard addendum. Was that exciting? <laughs> I hope y'all like forms and paperwork because you know what we do a lot of in real estate? There's an old joke. I don't know how funny it is, but there's an old joke. There's a form for everything. I got a form for that. Don't worry. Is there a, yep, I got a form for that. And that's what the real estate commission will tell you. Oh, we got a form for that. Don't worry. <laughs> so is there a form for that? There's a really good possibility. And if there's not, 
we have attorneys to draft up for us. Do your head one way or another. Can I, as a real estate agent, draft a legally binding document? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If you want to learn how to draft legally binding documents, you need to go to law school. That's the job for the attorney. Making sure you guys stay in your lane. All right, so a little bit more to talk about uh, in unit 20. Remember this unit, just it just makes us afraid um, of what's in our air, what we breathe. There's some scary stuff going on in here, in there. And we left each other last time talking about our electromagnetic fields. Um, you know, this is gonna come down to a personal decision. Some buyers wanna be near these things, some things don't. Um, the jury's still out. If there's any major health complications, um, if your buyer has concerns, they can contact the power company. The power company will come out and do an EMF test, an electromagnetic field test. So continuing on in unit 20, our scary unit. Up next, I'm on page 504. We have groundwater contamination. Groundwater is the water that exists at the earth's surface. That's the water that feeds into what is filtered and eventually becomes our drinking water, what comes out of our faucets. And when that water gets contaminated, we got problems, don't we? So sometimes spills, um, old underground storage tanks leak, um, various things. We're gonna talk about underground storage tanks next surface spills, those kind of things can affect our groundwater, thus possibly affect our drinking water. I told you guys last class, um, we talked about the concerns of carbon monoxide and I suggested you please run out and get a carbon monoxide detector. Um, when it comes to your, um, our groundwater being contaminated, it can happen in the blink of an eye. So while you're out shopping for a carbon monoxide detector, you may wanna take up, pick up some spare water, some drinking drinking water in the event that happens. Was it High Point four or five years ago? We got salmonella or Ebola or something scary like that in our drinking water. It was a scary, we were without it for a couple of days. You guys, my High Point people remember that? It was a scary, scary time. After that, I went to Costco and I got me some water. <laughs> we live and we learn, don't we? <laughs> So groundwater contamination is absolutely an environmental concern. Another environmental concern is our underground storage tanks. These have gotten very concerning uh, in the last 10 years or so. So an underground storage tank, um, they're usually steel and we bury them. There's some kind of contents in there like oil or gas. And sometimes over time, these underground storage tanks leak. And when they leak, they, they rust out, right? The steel rusts and then the contents that's in the tank will leak out and it affects our groundwater. Some are still in use. Um, if you wanna know if you're getting ready to list a property for sale or help a buyer buy, if you're walking in the backyard and you trip over a pipe, sticking out of the yard, it's safe to say it's attached to an underground storage tank, right? So sometimes they're still in use, sometimes they're still in play. But guys, the sad part of our history, there was a time in our past where we thought the simple solution to these things when they were abandoned or when they weren't being used anymore, the simple solution was just take them out somewhere, bury them, bury the pipe, you know, just bury everything, have no trace of their existence, out of sight, out of mind, no problem, right? Well, the problem is, is that now they're leaking and they're causing big problems. Um, it's estimated that there are a billion underground storage tanks in the United States of America. We thought that was a good idea. We've learned the errors of our ways. We have experts to help us control them. You and I are not out there uh, maintaining them or controlling them. Um, the problem or one of the problems with the underground storage tanks is the second bullet point you're looking at. 
if a leak happens, who is responsible for it? It's the owner of the property where the tank is located. You could buy a home, you could own a home right now and not know that there's an underground storage tank. So the current owner, whomever owns the property, they're the ones that are liable for cleanup. Just make yourself a note. There's a fascinating story in your book on page 505. Please don't try to read it now, but just make yourself a note because I think this is like the epitome of how underground storage tanks can go wrong, really wrong, really fast. Um, again, there are regulations for detaining the underground storage tank, cleaning it up or removal. We're gonna let the experts handle this. Um, how they take care of it just depends on so many factors, but there are state and federal laws uh, revolved around the proper um, removal or detention of these things. These are regulated by the North Carolina Leaky Petroleum Underground Storage Tank Cleanup Act. Long word, <laughs> but we'll see this again on page 510. That's just more for an FYI. Just to reinforce that there is federal and state regulations. If you see a pipe sticking out of the ground and you think you got it abandoned underground storage tank, y'all, you can't run out there with a funnel and some kitty litter and say you're gonna take care of it. There's much more involved to it than that. So call the experts to, uh, to take care of it. When it comes to underground storage tanks, what does this mean for us? We have a duty to disclose what we know. If I don't know there's an underground storage tank there, if I have no reason for a little red flag to go up, in other words, if I don't trip over a pipe in the yard, I have no reason to know it's there. Guys, we're not expected to go out there with our metal detector and seek these things out. But if we learn of an underground storage tank, uh, then we need to disclose that there is one there. If your buyers are thinking about buying and we find out there's one there, then they're encouraged to have it tested, have it inspected, learn more about it. Good morning. Another environmental thing we have is our waste disposal sites. Um, these are our landfills. Landfills are either um, what's left over from a mining operation. Um, they could also be, good morning, they could also be, um, you know, you could just excavate the source for it. Um, landfills are heavily regulated. They got federal, state, and local regulations. Um, how they're controlled. They got controlled drainage, for example. So when the, you know, the water and the garbage juice, we'll call it, drains, it controls where it goes. So it doesn't get into our groundwater. So it doesn't contaminate our land. Um, part of the big challenge with landfills is breaking down um, all that, all that trash, all that waste we throw away. Some buyers don't want to live near a landfill. So the best way to find out if there's a landfill nearby, Google Maps. Let's look around, let's see what's surrounding, let's see what's nearby. If it's a concern for them, then we're gonna make sure that uh, they don't live near there. Part of the reason why some people don't like to live near a landfill, if you live next door to a landfill and you walk outside on a hot August day and take a big deep breath, it does not smell good. So some buyers want to be away from these things. Another environmental concern is mold. Mold is everywhere, y'all. Let's all take a big deep breath together. You ready? You probably just breathed in some kind of mold spore. Sorry, I didn't mean to trick you, but mold <laughs> is everywhere. And mold ranges. There's all varieties of mold. You got the mold on that loaf of bread that you've had too long, and it ranges the whole way to black toxic mold, which is as bad and scary as it sounds and all the variations in between. All mold needs is a little bit of oxygen and a little bit of moisture and it can take off. Mold can spread really, really quick, really fast if the conditions um, are right. 
Again, the, some of the mold spores can get in the air. We breathe the air. So we have respiratory problems. Again, mold mediation and removal needs to be handled by the experts. Uh, we can't just spray it down with bleach uh, and think it's gonna go away. We kind of let the experts handle that. <clears throat> the Real Estate Commission tells us what we need to know about mold. And the Real Estate Commission says for brokers that the mere presence of mold isn't a material fact, unless it's in an excessive amount. Now they define an excessive amount more than one square foot. So if you have more than one square foot of mold, and it's been my experience that you know if you have one more than one square foot of mold, because you can usually see it or smell it. Have you guys ever walked down into a, a, a concrete or cement basement a dirt basement and said, gee, it smells basement-y down here. There's no flavor of basement-y. Probably what you're smelling is some kind of mold or mildew, something like that. So if you can smell it, then there's probably um, some nearby. Again, I can only disclose what I know and I'm always constantly on the lookout for my little red flags. So if I walk in the basement and I go, this smells basement-y, I should have a little red flag, go up, ask some questions, investigate, try to find out more about it. And more importantly, encourage your buyers to have it tested uh, if they are concerned. You know, anytime um, you find out that there was any kind of previous leak or flood in the home, maybe the roof leaked, um, and it leaked for a while before it was discovered. Uh, maybe there was a pipe that burst, for example. Um, those could also be red flags for us to pay attention to that possibly that could cause that could cause mold. Again, it doesn't need much. So when we talk about these environmental issues, <clears throat> whether we're talking state or North Carolina, um, kind of a good source other than the EPA. Uh, there's something called the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. You guys good if I call it CERCLA going forward? Uh, like I said, if we can make an acronym out of it in this industry, we're going to because some of our words and phrases are really long. So CERCLA is just who provides the funding to help clean up um, if you own a property and you have an underground storage tank and you find it was discovered that it leaked um, and you're responsible for cleanup, CERCLA may be able to help you with those finances. They may be able to help you. So that's where we're um, getting our funding from, hopefully, to help the owner of that property get that taken care of. And with these environmental issues, uh, kind of as we have been saying, the fault, the responsibility lays on the owner. So the owner of the property is who's going to be liable. Uh, while you and I are never going to be asked to, well, we might be asked, but while you and I are not capable of cleaning up any of these environmental issues, again, we can help our customers point them in the right direction of where they need to go for assistance with this cleanup uh, to get this taken care of. With that being said, please don't think that we are completely off the hook. While the owner does carry the most liability, we as brokers, we have to disclose what we know. So once we learn of an environmental, uh, environmental concern, we've got to disclose that. It's not my job to find, again, I'm not gonna go out in the yard with my metal detector and look for an underground storage tank. But when my little red flag goes up, y'all remember our little red flags? We're starting to pay attention to those little red flags. And when that little red flag goes up, then we now have a duty to ask some questions, encourage our clients and customers to learn more about it, et cetera. Uh, just to point out in your book, pages 510 and 511, there's just several, I don't think you guys need to know these, but just to point it out, there's several, um, there's that Underground Storage Tank Cleanup Act we just saw. There's Coastal Area Management Act, Mountain Ridge Protection Act, Dredge and Fill Act, 
uh, Sediment Pollution Control Act. So there's various acts out there for various things, uh, all to aid and assist in cleanup or, you know, retention, try to keep it from spilling to begin. And that wraps up unit 20, we were close. So those key terms, we saw a lot of green stars in unit 20. Um, I'm getting ready to have a conversation. We're getting ready to remember what all those green stars mean. Uh, for right now, let's just know, very basic understanding, very basic understanding. Y'all, please don't spend all your study time on unit 20. We are getting ready to get into the material that you spend your study time. So those key terms on page 497, your key point review on page 512, and then you got your student quiz, page 515. Questions on unit 20. Okay. We good? Everybody have these? Good, 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 good. So we are going, y'all want to Kahoot? Let's Kahoot. Y'all get your phones out. Grab your phones. I'll get you a code. We are going to Kahoot. This Kahoot is, there's some questions on unit four. There's some questions from unit five. And there's some questions from unit six. So is it loading? There we go. Uh, if you want to scan the QR code, that's the fastest way to get in. Uh, you can also go to the website, or if you have already downloaded the app, um, you get in that way as well. I like the QR code. You just pop right in. Either way, once you get in, you're asked to enter a name. I don't care if you use nicknames or whatever. Doesn't matter to me. I just ask that you keep it clean. Again, this Kahoot is four, five, and six. So unit four was our legal description, five was our title and deed, six was our land use controls, both zoning and restrictive covenants. And if your phone goes to sleep, you'll kind of get kicked off. If you don't wanna play on your phone, that's fine. You can play in your mind. Uh, if you don't want to play on your phone and you still want to play, you're welcome to tell me what you think your answer is in a private chat. Please do so in a private chat. But I think it's fun to play on your phone. Kind of two birds, one stone, right? We can learn and have fun. It's possible to do both at the same time. All right, everybody in that wants to play? Everybody ready? All right. Let's Kahoot. So units four, five, and six. Question number one. The system of legal description that defines a parcel of land by its parameter is the ten seconds. System of legal description that defines a parcel of land as this parameter. Good job, guys, is the meets and bounds. Remember the meets and bounds, it gives us the point of beginning. So we start here and then we take a tour of the parameter of the property. And we move from monument to monument, corner to corner of the property, if you will, working our way around the property um, until we get back to the point of beginning. Um, the lot and block system is also known as our recorded plat. So uh, we can use a plat map, we can use that, but it's mapped out when the development is being created. Um, and that is helpful. It allows us to see the lot numbers, lot dimensions, 
uh, that kind of thing. Questions on this one? Let's see who answered it. Not only right, but the fastest. Fifi was quick draw this time. Uh, Haley was right behind her. Lee, Abriana, and PJ got in the fastest. Question number two. In a North Carolina real estate transaction, excise taxes are the responsibility of the Ten seconds. Who's responsible for excise taxes? The seller. Seller pays excise taxes. We looked at those at the end of unit five. Uh, we'll see those again when we go to closing in unit 21. But excise taxes are the responsibility of the seller. They put it, they tax you to sell your home. And that's what we're paying as a tax. Can I just say I love you guys so much? I don't believe, well, no, a couple of you did. Say very few of you say me. And, and I just love that because you guys are like, I don't know what that is, but I don't want to pay for it. So we're going to let the attorney, the buyer, <laughs> or the seller to pay for it. I very rarely have anybody say the agent. Um, but yes, the seller, the seller is responsible for those excise taxes. Questions? Again, we'll go to closing and we'll break down who's responsible for what, paying what, uh, that all comes in unit 21. So Lee climbed up, PJ climbed up, Haley, uh, Ashley and B. Nicolette, Nicolette is our highest climber. She's up 10 places. Good job. Question number three, which of the following deeds contains no express or implied warranties? No warranties. Ten seconds. What's our no warranty deed? The quick claim deed. Remember, the quick claim deed says, "What I got, you get." So if I got nothing, what you get? Absolutely nothing. There are no warranties. There's no promises. There's no covenants. We typically use the quick claim deed. Uh, maybe. Maybe we're fixing an error. Maybe your name was misspelled. So we want to fix that. Uh, maybe you want to create an easement or terminate an easement. We would use a quit claim deed. Uh, if you get married or divorced, possibly a quit claim deed could be used in that. Questions on this one? So we got Jumble up again. Felicia's on top now. Ashley crept up. B came up. Lee and Haley. Uh, Andrews, our highest climber this round. He's up 10 places. Yay. Question number four. Which of the following is an essential element of a valid North Carolina deed? Ten seconds. What's an essential element of a valid deed? Let's look together. I'm ready for you guys on page 87. This tends to be a problem topic. So let's go back and review this. Make sure we are all good. Page 87. 87 gives us the requirements for a valid deed, requirements for a valid conveyance. Guys, please remember, when we are referring to the validity of a document, we're referring to does a judge, would a judge rule it as a valid, in this case, deed. So the judge is looking for these requirements that we see at the top of page 87. 
And one of those is going to be words of conveyance. The grantor is the seller, the giver of the deed. The grantor, the deed has to specify, I, the grantor, hereby do give my property to the grantee. It's got, it may not be like that, but it's got to specifically say, I am giving you my property, conveying my property. Um, the grantee does not sign the deed. The grantor signs the deed. The seller has to sign their deed over to the new buyer. Okay, see how they like to trick you? You see what they like to do to you? We got to know this stuff pretty well, don't we? So the grantee does not sign. And then the problem topic, and I'm aware of this, and this is why I like this Kahoot question so we can review this again. I'll flip over back to pay or go to page 88. What we just saw in 87 are the things that the judge is looking for to determine it valid. The judge doesn't care if it's recorded or not. The judge will rule a deed as valid, even if it's not on record. It's the Connor Act that requires it to be recorded. So do your head one way or another. Do our deeds have to be recorded? Do we record our deeds? Do we record our deeds down in the courthouse? Yeah. Oh yeah, every single time. Why? It's not because that's the ingredient that makes a deed. It's because the Connor Act says you've got to record this. Does everybody see this? So we got the essential elements, the required ingredients, and then we have the additional ingredients like the sprinkles and the whipped cream and the cherry on top. And that's Connor. Yes, ma'am. So for our test purposes, like, will it say under the Connor Act or because this It'll, one's North Carolina, so it's hard to determine which one word here is if the document is valid. Okay. So if it so, asks you about the Connor Act, we know that it has to be recorded because that's what Connor's about. Connor says there's certain documents that have to be recorded. Why do we record documents? So they're enforceable against third parties. We don't record to make them valid. We record to make them enforceable against third parties. Okay, so if this question were to say, which of the following is an essential element of a, an enforceable North Carolina deed, it would be recorded would be a valid answer. No. The reason we record is so it's enforceable against third parties. That's a whole sentence. We record so it's enforceable. Enforceable against what? Third parties. So you're yeah. not going to have a question that asks you about valid and enforceable in the same. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If it's going to ask you about valid, we're asking what if the judge will determine that it's a valid deed. Connor takes that a step further and says, okay, the judge has said this is valid. Now Connor steps in and says, I need you to record it. And why do I want you to record it? So it's enforceable against third parties. Okay. Guys, please remember, deed is your proof. Deed is your documentary evidence that you own this property. And the only way you can tell third parties that you own it, prove to third parties that you own it, is by recording. And that's the requirement of Connor. See what they like to do to you? What other questions do I have on this? We're gonna talk about the essential elements of a valid contract. We're gonna talk about the essential elements of a valid lease. We're gonna talk about essential elements of other valid documents. And whenever we're referring to the validity of a document, what we're saying is if a judge were to look at this, would they rule it valid or not? Okay, anything else? Um, again, 87, those bullet points at the top and then 88, those bullet points a little over halfway down. I suggest doing a side-by-side -side comparison. Take your notebook paper after class, of course, please don't try to do it now, uh, but write down on your notebook. This is what is essential. This is the required ingredients. These are the sprinkles and the cherry on top. OK, 
Okay. All right, let's see how this might have shook things up a bit. Let's see what we got. Uh, student, good name, who's up at the top? Lee, clipped up, Jack, Ashley. Here's Felicia. Uh, Fifi's our highest climber. She's up nine places. Question number five, restrictive covenants. Ten seconds. Restrictive covenants apply to and bind all successive owners of the property. Restrictive covenants are a pertinent, which means they run with what? They run with the land. They don't run with the property owner. They run with the land. So as owners come and go, if something's a pertinent, it conveys with it, it remains. Um, the developer does create the restrictive covenants as part of his subdivision plan or her subdivision plan. But once the developer leaves, the restrictive covenants remain and they stay on the property for as long, they're pertinent. So they stay for as long as, as the property is there. Questions on this one? So we got, that did not budge, did it? Student, Lee's on fire now. Do you have a little fire symbol on your phone? Uh, Jack, Ashley, and Felicia. Everybody stay put there. Question number six, the primary intent of zoning ordinances is to, Ten seconds. It's the primary intent of zoning is it controls the land, the structures, how we use it. Um, please remember, you guys, zoning is local. There are no statewide zoning ordinances. Zoning is local. Each city, county, town, municipality lays out their own zoning. Raleigh does not come in and say, we're Raleigh, we're the state, we're gonna tell you what to do. Um, zoning may have a buffer zone. It may protect residential neighborhoods. It can't protect from encroachments, but it may have a buffer zone. But again, that's not its primary intent. The whole intent of zoning is to control how we use the land and the structures that we put on our land. Remember, it's all about being in accordance with the master plan. Where do we see ourselves in 20 years? Questions on this one? So shuffled around just a bit. Lee's up top now. Ashley, Jack, Haley, and student. Uh, Naya's our highest climber, up seven places. And our last Kahoot, which of the following best describes a variance? Ten seconds. Variance is best described as an exception to zoning ordinance. How many property owners can request a variance? You can show me. How many property owners? How many? Just one. Just one. One property owner is basically going to the zoning board and asking permission to break the rules. They're asking to be an exception from these current zoning ordinances. Uh, Pre-existing use that varies from a current code, that's a non-conforming use. 
So we talked about our non-conforming use. The use doesn't conform with the rules. Maybe it's legal, maybe it's illegal. They are both non-conforming uses. Questions on this one? It is podium winners. Third place is Ashley. Good job. Seven out of seven. That's great. Second place is Haley. Good job. And then our first place is Lee. I also got a fourth and fifth runner up, Valerie and Jack. Good job, everybody. The questions on this Kahoot. Is this helpful? Is it helpful to, I know it's fun, whatever, but is it helpful? Good. Good. I think, I think it's, I think it's a nice break away from the PowerPoint for a minute. Kind of gives me an idea to see where we are as a whole. Um, I hope it helps you guys kind of see uh, various places that you may want to go back and review. And guys, remember, I, I can't give you access to my Kahoot, uh, but we are recording. So if you want to go back through and watch the Kahoot again, I just make a note. What time do we start? About 920? ish something like that and you can go back to the recording and, and catch it that way questions all right before we go into break i got a couple of announcements uh first off please don't forget next week our schedule changes a little bit doesn't it we don't have class next thursday so we'll meet on tuesday and then no class on Thursday. Have everybody so far. Y'all don't call me Thursday morning and wanna know where I am. <laughs> no class Thursday. We'll talk on Tuesday uh, where we leave off, what we need to do to get you guys ready for the following Tuesday. So no class next week. And also please remember, starting on October 4th, we got four classes that we're gonna meet from nine to two. We got an expanded four class. Everybody see that? Please make these, if you haven't already, please make these notes on your calendar uh, so you know when to be here and when not to be here. Questions on our dates. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out, I'm getting a couple of questions and we're getting into a good section. Um, as we come back from break and we start on unit seven. Um, you know, now that we're in it a little bit, we're seven units in already, one through six and 20. So we're seven units in already. It's taken us, what, about two weeks to get through seven units? We're going to spend the next two and a half weeks on the next four units. So units seven, eight, nine, and 10, we're slowing down a bit. But guess what? The material's getting deeper. We're getting more in depth. I mentioned this the other day. Um, I'll mention it again. I'll probably mention it 20 more times while we're together. Units seven, eight, nine, and 10 are heavily tested units. Seven, eight, nine, and 10. I'm kind of a math nerd. Y'all know that about me now. And I sat down with your test once and I figured out that 40% of your exam comes from units seven, eight, nine, and 10, 40 percent. So this is where we're heading. And I think this is a good time to remind ourselves about the syllabus. Again, it's in Learn Test Pass, the syllabus. Have you guys had a chance to kind of look through this? I don't expect you guys to print this out and sit down and read it, but I think that we kind of look through it and get familiar with what's in here. Because I don't think it's a bad idea for certain units such as seven, eight, nine, and 10 to read it so you're aware um, of what we need to know. Guys, please remember the Real Estate Commission says, if it's a candidate for your state exam, it's in the syllabus. And I wrote this class with the syllabus in, the hand, with, in my hand. So I don't need you guys to ever worry about, are we gonna be tested on this? If we're talking about it in class, it's from the syllabus. If it's from the syllabus, it's a good candidate for your exam. I'm starting to get a couple questions too about the uh, stars on my PowerPoint slide. So the syllabus identifies all the material 
as a level one, a level two, or a level three. And the stars on my PowerPoints correlate to the, to the levels in the syllabus. So a green star is a level one, according to the Real Estate Commission, which means we just need to be able to recall facts and basic concepts. Level two in my class is a yellow star. That's an application. You need to be able to use this information um, in situations, be able to apply it in various situations. This is yellow star. And then yellow three, I'm sorry, yellow three. Level three, what the syllabus calls level three, we call a red star. So you need to be able to explain level three material to somebody else in a way that they understand it. Have you guys started using your family and friends yet to help you study? They're a great tool. You may need to buy them dinner or something, but have conversations with your family. You know, talk to them as we start going through agency. Talk to them about agency. And if they say, I have no idea what you're talking about, you need to go back and revisit agency. As we get into seven, eight, nine, and 10, we're getting ready to see lots of red stars. Guys, I need you to understand. Once you get your license, it's going to be your job to explain agency to the public. So it all starts here. It all starts today, getting that understanding. Nobody's going to leave this call today as an expert in explaining agency. It's just not going to happen. How you learn agency is by exposing yourself to it over and over and over again, going back and reviewing, going back and refreshing re-watching the recording, looking at the book, taking the practice tests, et cetera. Um, I hope you've started developing good study habits because as we get into today, next week, the following week, uh, we're gonna need to, 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 to keep up. Um, agency, I'm just gonna point out real quick, this is the stuff we've already covered, blah, blah, blah. I'll get you in just one second. Let me see what I can't find what I'm looking for. There's liens. Da, 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 da. It's like an outline of the class. So I don't think it's a bad idea that you guys look through it. I read through it. It's yet another way to expose yourself to the material. Still scrolling, still scrolling. Environmental hazards, boom. Okay, agency. Where we're starting today in unit seven is page 29 of the syllabus. So brokerage relationships, laws and practice. In this unit, starting in this unit, we're also going to start getting into license law and commission rule. Um, and we'll discuss the various laws and rules that you need to know, don't worry. But one thing I like about the syllabus that I do want to point out, do you guys see like uh, down here, it tells you, let's see, commission rule 58A104. You guys see this? If you click on this, it actually takes you to that commission rule. So here's the commission rule on agency agreements and disclosures. So I think the syllabus does a good job of directing us to what we need to know about agency agreements and disclosures. Um, so anytime you kind of see a hyperlink like that in the syllabus, it's taking you to where you need to go so you don't have to, so you don't have to find it. So I had a hand first and I don't remember, let me go back. Who was that? It was me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hey. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know if it was possible to retake the quizzes after you've already finished them out, or if it's just like a one-time. What? Um, learn test pass? Yes. Yeah. No, you can take it as many times as you want. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And guys, remember, even when in your textbook, when you guys are doing quizzes at the end of the unit, don't write in your book. Keep the quizzes in the unit blank so you can take those over again. So if you're sitting down to do the unit seven quiz, just take a piece of paper out of your notebook and write your answers on that. So you can take those again, because you're right. As we get closer to the test, you're gonna to wanna to come back uh, and revisit, review this stuff. Uh, let's see, are there practical tests available online that we can take follows a syllabus? Um, here's my caution about going to the internet. Could you go to the internet and type in pass my pre-licensing exam and get results? <laughs> oh, you bet. Um, guys, I can't validate the internet. 
I don't know what's good, what's bad. I can't go to Google and search everything that's out there and tell you what's good or bad. So we have learned test pass. We have our textbooks. There are some other good resources out there. Um, I've heard, I don't know for sure, but I've heard exam prep is a good one. Um, you may want to just kind of go out there and see what you find, but I caution you to please don't just, we know Google, you got to take it all with a grain of salt, right? So if you're not sure about something, maybe reach out to Lane or I, see if we've heard about it or been exposed. Um, guys, I had a student once came to me, she was about in tears. She was so confused. She was so lost, poor thing. And I said, she said, I heard this and they said that and that. And I said, where are you getting your information? We sourced it. She went and Googled pre-licensing and she'd been watching videos. Like I record my videos, she was watching videos. But you know what? She was watching videos from an instructor in Florida. Florida and North Carolina are two states. So if you're Googling, please make sure you, I said, my God, you poor thing. She, of course she was confused. So any conflicting information you find online, please let the syllabus of your textbook rule. Everybody with me? And again, you guys, please don't run out and start buying money and to, uh, spending money on some of you. I fear some of you guys spend more study time looking for stuff to study than you do actually studying. So if you've been through the entire textbook cover to cover and you've been through everything and learn test pass, maybe reach out to Lane and I and see if we have other suggestions. But why spend money until you've utilized the tools that have already been given to you? I'm trying to help your wallet out here a little bit too. A question comes in, do we have one exam on the whole class? Yep. The only thing you have to do for my class, meet the attendance requirements. How many hours can we miss? How many hours? Nope, a little bit more than that. 15, 15 hours, 15 is the max. So you can miss 15 hours. So all you have to do to get out of my class is meet the attendance requirement and pass our end of class exam. You don't have to pick your book up. You don't have to do learn test pass. You don't have to look at the syllabus. You don't have to do anything. I don't know how you're gonna pass my test if you don't do anything. You guys are adults, I can't make you do anything. I can just stress the importance of and highly recommend that you go through this material as go. My end of class exam is 112 questions. And we will talk about both the state exam and my end of class exam as we go. Everybody good? It's a lot, I get it. I hope you guys started two weeks ago forming good study habits. Have we dedicated time to study? Have we put it in our calendar? Are we making ourselves sit down with our book and making ourselves sit down with this material? If you haven't done that yet, I'm begging you to start at 105 today. The questions or comments? Let's go ahead and take our break. And when we come back, the much anticipated unit seven. Uh, that's correct. I'll address that when we come back from break. Yep.
We're back. All right. So I am taking attendance. And um, I had a question come in the chat right as we were going to uh, to break. Um, so I do want to make sure I address that. Uh, the question says, so we can't take the state exam until you pass my test. That's right. There are two exams that stand between you and your real estate license. The first exam, the first hurdle, if you will, is completing successfully completing the end of course exam in any pre-licensing class in the state of North Carolina, not just my test. And then once you complete successfully complete pre-licensing, then you go take the state exam. But you can't take the state exam until you complete pre-licensing. Does this make sense? You can't move your hurdles around. Okay. The other thing I want to uh, address, I just want to take this time as we are getting into this unit and remind you guys that I'm here to help. I know we're getting into some big stuff and I don't want you guys to ever feel that you're out there struggling on your own. So let me help you. If there are specific test questions that are tripping you up, send them to me. Send me a picture, or send me a screenshot and say, Julie, I just don't get why this is C. Guys, have we done enough practice questions up to this point to know that every single word means something? And if you change just one word, it can change the entire meaning of the whole question. Have we, have we been around long enough to know that? It all means something. So if you guys call me and say, the test question says something like this, I'm not gonna be able to answer it because I need to see every single word to best help you. Does that make sense? It's been my experience. If you say it says something like this, you're gonna twist it just a bit to try to be right. <laughs> but until I see every word, I can't help you. So what helps me the best? Pictures, screenshots, let me see the actual question that you're that you're stuck on. Um, I may or may not have my book with me. So if it's a question from your book, send me a picture or that you got to wait till I get home where I can see it. Same thing with learn test pass. That's one thing about getting your real estate license. Once you pass these exams, you don't have to lug this thing around with you everywhere you go. So um, if you want an immediate answer, you may just want to send me a picture. Um, of the question so I can see it. Comments, concerns. This is why we're here, isn't it? We wanna learn about the brokerage relationships. We wanna know what my role is to the consumers, to the buyers and the sellers that I'm getting ready to work with. Now, I just specifically mentioned buyers and sellers because I will say, um, thank you for telling me that you're back from break. Thank you. Um, if I missed you for screenshot, please tell me you're back. So I can give you credit for this hour. Um, seven and eight are our agency units. So in unit seven, we're going to get into brokerage and we continue in eight, all about agency and brokerage uh, responsibilities and duties. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. No, it'll come back to me. These two units, see, just come back. These two units, the, the primary focus is sales. So may that be residential sales or commercial sales. So the big focus in these two units is going to be working with buyers and sellers. I do have a unit for landlord tenants. We will briefly mention a few things about that relationship in these units as well. But the conversation is going to be heavy residential sales and commercial sales, working with buyers and sellers. Y'all ready? So in unit seven, we're gonna talk about, we got different types of agency. Uh, we're gonna learn a whole lot of new words. Uh, here's one we're gonna learn, it's called a fiduciary. Um, as you're going through this stuff, if you don't know, don't know what a word means, look it up. You got a glossary in the back of your book, you got your book in front. Y'all have this phenomenal tool at your fingertips called Google. You don't know what fiduciary means? Look it up. 
part of this is understanding we're spark, tar, starting to speak broker, uh, but we need to know what the words mean. So we'll talk about agency and this fancy word fiduciary. We're gonna talk about the difference in a customer and a client, and we're gonna define what our roles are for each. There are certain duties that I owe my client that I don't owe my customer as a broker. And then we're gonna talk about how I disclose my agency status uh, when I'm working with consumers, when I'm dealing with consumers. Before we get in the book, y'all just put your book down for a second. Let's just have a conversation about a few things, kind of soft introduce you to some terms, to some ideas. I think if we can understand these ideas, it's gonna help us wrap our brain around some of this material. So everything that we're getting ready to say right now, we will talk about again later in your book, but let's just start with a little introduction start to wrap our brains. Let's just listen for a second. We're getting ready to meet something called caveat emptor. Caveat emptor is Latin for let the buyer beware. North Carolina is a caveat emptor state, which means it is the buyer's responsibility to learn about the home before they purchase it. The seller doesn't have to disclose much. The seller doesn't have to disclose what's wrong. It's the buyer's responsibility to learn about it. When the buyer hires an agent, we take on that responsibility with them. So my role as the buyer's agent is to help them learn about the home to decide if this is a good purchase for them or not. <laughs> Y'all ready for this? I got some mind blowing information. There is no such thing as a perfect home. Every single home has problems. Every single home has something wrong with it. Even brand new construction, you can find something wrong with it. Don't humans build these things? Don't humans make mistakes? So is there a problem with this home that your buyer's looking at? Of course there is, because there's no such thing as a perfect home. But what we're hired to do, what we our responsibility is to help them find what's wrong. Why? Because the onus in North Carolina is on the buyer. The principal or the client, which we will define in just a second, hires the real estate firm. They do not hire the individual agent. Have you guys ever heard agents running around talking about my buyer and my seller? That's not completely accurate. The client hires the firm. The firm allows me to work with their principal. We'll look at our agency agreements when we get to unit eight, and we will see that the contracting relationship is between, for example, the seller and the firm. Now let's make sure we understand what firm is. Firm is the entity, firm is the business. Firm could be a one-man show. You could have one broker known as a sole practitioner that operates on their own. It's a one-man show. You could also have a firm with 17 office locations and over a thousand agents in it. So a firm could be one of many, it could be one, and it can be anywhere in between. The principal hires the firm. The firm allows the agent, the individual broker, to work with their client. All homes in North Carolina are sold as is. In North Carolina, the seller is not required to do any repairs. Can they agree to do a repair? Can they agree to do a repair? Of course they can. Do they have to? Are they required? No. Homes are sold as is. The buyer is buying in their existing condition, which takes us back to why the onus is on the buyer to learn about as much as property as they can. When we get into unit eight, we're gonna start talking about your commission. In a typical sales transaction, the seller pays their listing firm, the firm that they hire to list and sell their home, the listing firm shares their commission with the firm that brings the buyer. In a typical transaction, 
We're gonna talk about some exemptions. One exemption, for example, is gonna be the for sale by owner. Also known, we're gonna make an acronym out of it, as the FISBO. The FISBO doesn't hire a firm. The FISBO chose to go on it on their own. They chose not to be represented. Is the FISBO gonna pay you? I don't know. It's up to them. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. What if the FISBO is not gonna pay you when you bring them a buyer? We will talk about that. Please don't ever worry about whether or not I'm gonna get you paid. As long as you do everything right, you follow the agency agreements, you follow the rules, we'll get you paid. Guys, real estate is, it's a people industry. And I fear sometimes agents or potential agents, you guys come into this class led by dollar signs. I'm gonna be a real estate agent. And I'm gonna make lots and lots and lots of money. If you're led by dollar signs, you may not be heading in the right direction. Trust me, if you take care of the people, the money will follow. You build those relationships. I will get you paid. I don't want you guys spending the next two weeks worrying about whether or not you're gonna get paid, okay? We will get you paid. We will talk about how you get paid, when you get paid. All that comes out in these two units, seven and eight. As real estate agents, we are fact finders. I provide the facts so that my clients can make an informed decision. Am I the one buying this house? Am I the one selling this house? Why do I get to be the one to make decisions? My opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm not the name on the deed. I'm not the one trying to buy this house. My job is to help them gather the facts so they can make that informed decision. Uh, does my opinion matter? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But I know bottom line, when my buyers look at me and say, what do you think about this? I don't think my opinion matters. That's what I think because your family dynamics are different than my family dynamics. So I may look at this space and say, no, this doesn't fit my family dynamics. And I've just told my buyer not to buy this house. I don't know if this space fits for your family. Does this make sense? So we're gonna help them decide if it fits for their family or not. Help them decide if this is what is best for them. Will my family fit here? No, this doesn't work for us. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work for you. We are fact finders. We're gonna help them find the information so they can make that informed decision. We're gonna start getting into some terminology. Now, right now we're gonna to refer to buyer's agents and seller's agents. But as we get into unit eight, as we start spending more time with our agency agreements, uh, the forms that connect us, we're gonna start seeing different verbiage. The one that works with the buyer is referred to as the buyer's agent. They're also referred to as the selling agent in the selling firm. The one working with the buyer is selling them the home, selling. The one working with the seller is referred to as the seller's agent, seller's firm. But the verbiage in our contracts, the verbiage in our agreements refers to the listing agent and the listing firm. We're gonna see this slide about two or three more times because there's confusion in the selling and the seller. So I want to introduce this to you now because as you're looking ahead, you're gonna start seeing this terminology. We need to look for, when we see the word sell, we need to look for the ing or the er. Does everybody see that? Ing, selling is working with the buyer, seller is working with the seller. So a soft introduction to some of the terms, terminology, where we're heading again, um, as you guys are looking ahead, you may have already encountered this. So I think it's important that we understand who we're referring to here, the selling firm and the listing firm. Do I have any questions or comments so far?
So far, so good. All right, so starting on page 134, let's introduce us to the idea of the law of agency. The law of agency governs how we represent other people. And as a real estate agent, as a broker, we represent other people. We represent buyers, we represent sellers. And how we represent those other people is dictated by the law of agency. Please understand, the law of agency is not one specific law. The law of agency is derived by several different places. Uh, the common law of agency uh, is probably where it started. This takes us back to the early days of England uh, when we had a king, we served the king. We knew how to treat our king because of that common law of agency. Over years, the law of agency is developed by contract law, uh, court rulings, for example. Whenever um, over the years, if people have taken a real estate firm or an agent to court, it's helped derive the law of agency as we know it today. Our North Carolina Real Estate Commission also provides us with license law and commission rule. We're gonna start introducing you guys to license law and commission rule uh, later in this unit. Um, license law and commission rule is what is gonna keep you out of trouble with the Real Estate Commission. This is their license law, North Carolina general statute. And then the Real Estate Commission has their own set of rules. So these four things together helped us form the relationship, the law of agency relationship uh, that we have today. And it continues to evolve. I can tell you what agency looks like today. I don't know what it may look like five years from now. I don't know what it may look like 10 years from now. We can expect change. We can expect as people go to court, as license law and commission rule updates, we can expect the rule or the, the uh, role, I should say, of the broker to evolve. For example, in your book, I ask you guys on page 135, again, please don't read it now, but on page 135, you have the Adena lawsuit. The Adena lawsuit helped pave the way for agency as we know it today. Prior to Adena lawsuit, most real estate transactions, we only represented the seller. Prior to the Adena lawsuit, buyers didn't have representation. Buyers didn't get to hire real estate agents. Buyers were out there on their own, doing their own thing. I think the best way to understand that, wrap our brain around that, have you ever been shopping for a new car? and you go to a car lot and the salesman comes up, asks you what, what you're looking for, what you wanna buy, da, 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 da. The salesman represents the listing company, right? The car, the car company, whomever's selling the car. The salesman has their best interest. Does the salesman have your best interest? Do they care about you and getting you in the right car? No, their job is to sell a car. What happens if you don't like any cars that they have on their lot? You probably, yeah, you leave and go to the next lot, right? And you keep going from car lot to car lot until you find the car that you wanna buy. Prior to the Adena lawsuit, this was how real estate was handled. We didn't work with buyers, we worked with sellers. So you would go to this real estate company and you would say, what products do you have for sale? And if you didn't like anything, you would go to the next real estate company. And if you didn't like, and you would keep going from real estate company to real estate company until you found the house that you wanted to buy. That was all fine and dandy for many, many years until this Adina lawsuit hit. There was a case that started, a buyer felt like they were led to believe that the agent had their best interest in mind. The buyer felt that the firm represented them. The reason they felt this way was based off of the agent's actions. The agent led them to believe that they best represented them. The buyer bought, after closing, they found problems. 
they ensued in a lawsuit. It was one of those things, you know, sometimes you have situations where one person sues and then a whole bunch of other people step up and say, oh yeah, me too. So one buyer started it, others joined. Y'all, this resulted in a settlement for Adina that was about 19 plus million, that's with an M, million dollars. And that is what caused other states, including North Carolina, to revisit their idea of agency, to revisit how we represent, who we represent, when we represent, and how we handle ourselves. I need you guys to understand, buyer's agency didn't come to North Carolina until about the mid-90s. That wasn't that long ago, was it? So prior to the mid 90s, we didn't have a buyer agency. Guys, there are still some states today that don't have a buyer's agent. There are still some states today that don't have, um, that don't recognize buyer agency. They still only work with sellers. So if you're ever going from state to state, more importantly, if you're ever working with somebody, a buyer, for example, that's from another state, they may not know how we do things in North Carolina. So I think it's important that we know where we came from so we know where we are today and why we're here today. So today we can work with sellers, we can work with buyers, we can work with both in the same transaction. And we're gonna talk about all that and how we do that in this unit. So we met caveat mTOR a few minutes ago. This is Latin. And remember, caveat mTOR is Latin for let the buyer beware. In North Carolina, the burden of discovery is on the buyer. The seller can choose not to disclose anything. Gosh, what have I already said? Seller doesn't have to disclose. Seller doesn't have to do any repairs. What am I telling you guys? In North Carolina, we favor who? We favor the sellers. Maybe that's our history after Adina, I don't know. But North Carolina it's remained a caveat mTOR state. It's not the seller's responsibility to disclose. It's the buyer's responsibility to learn. Even though the seller doesn't have to disclose much, there are a few exceptions. I don't wanna get bogged down on that right now. Even though the seller doesn't have to, to disclose much, that still doesn't give them a free ticket to lie. There are rules and regulations out there to protect the buyer from fraud, um, misrepresentation. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So they don't have to disclose, but they're still not allowed to lie. Our relationships with our buyers and sellers, when they hire that, hire us, is that of a fiduciary relationship. And a fiduciary relationship is a relationship of trust. When my buyer hires me, when the seller hires me, they need to know that they can trust me. They need to know that I have their entire best interest in mind Sometimes their best interest is not what my best interest is. But the law of agency says my best interest goes to the benefit of my buyer or seller before me. I have my clients ahead of me. And they need to know when they hire me that I'm in it for them. Guys, real estate is not about you. Let's get that out of the way. It ain't about you. It's about the people that hire you. Please look with me on page 137. We're gonna define some words. They're all spelled out for you. I got them on page 137. Agency is the fiduciary relationship between the client and the firm. Remember, 
The buyer and the seller don't hire the individual agent. They hire the firm. May that be a one man show or a firm of thousands. Agency is that relationship that exists. Agency is the idea that one party represents another. Agency is the idea that one party represents another. The person that hires us is our principal, also known as our client. These two words can be and are used interchangeably. The person that hires us, and we're gonna talk about how they hire and all that, I'm getting there. The person that hires us is our principal, also our client. The agent is the individual person that is allowed to work with the firm's client. Remember, it ain't my buyer, it's not my seller. It's the firm's buyer, it's the firm's seller. Thank you firm for letting me work with your client. So the agent is the individual. Sub-agent, when you see sub-agent, when you guys see the word sub, agent i'd like you to see the word sub you know like submarine for example sub is a prefix for under so when we talk about sub agency what i'm saying is an agent of an agent we will talk about sub agency this is one of these things that isn't necessarily easy to wrap your brain around so we will spend time on sub agency when we get there for right now let's just understand that sub agency is an agent of an agent, you are an agent under another agent. We will talk about that. The customer is the third party that didn't hire me. I can take my entire market and I can put all consumers into two categories. You either my client and you hire me or you're my customer and you don't. The consumers can be divvied up into two groups. You're either my client or my customer. We will differentiate these roles. We will talk more about these roles. I owe different duties to both. In one transaction, I'm working with both. I have a client and I more than likely have a customer. So we will spend quite a bit of time on the client customer relationship. A facilitator broker or a transactional broker is a non-agency. With a transactional broker, nobody is the client. Nobody is represented. Everybody is a customer. You're facilitating the transaction. In North Carolina, transactional broker is not allowed. If you're involved in the transaction, somebody needs to be a client. May that be the seller, may that be the buyer. If you're involved as a real estate agent in the transaction, somebody has to be a client. Transactional brokerage. If you're in North Carolina, or excuse me, if you're a transactional broker, your best interest is not the people, is it? Your best interest is the transaction. And in North Carolina, because we are a um, law of agency state, if we're involved, Somebody has to be represented. Guys, this is one of these things. The public doesn't know what I can and can't do. That's my job to know that. That's not theirs. And that's why we're here. You may get a call from an unrepresented buyer. Maybe it's your best friend. And they're interested in a for sale by owner. Well, the for sale by owners already decided to go it on your own and your best friend for some reason doesn't want to hire you, they're going to ask you, can you just facilitate this transaction for me? And what's your answer to them? Do your head one way or another. Can I facilitate this transaction? No. BFF, if you want me involved, somebody has to hire me. 
Again, you guys, it's not their job to know what we can and can't do. That's our job. I actually got this call from one of my um, teammates a couple months ago, that exact same thing. A buyer came up to them and said, I don't need to be hired when they're best friend. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to hire you, but I found it for sale by owner. I want you to help me with it. Can you? And they call me and say, what do I tell them? And I say, in North Carolina, somebody's got to hire you. Transactional broker is not um, allowed in North Carolina. It's similar to wholesale. Wholesale is a new thing coming into real estate quite rapidly. Um, I don't know much about wholesale, so I'm hesitant to answer that question because I don't know much about how that relationship, if any relationship is formed. So let me just say if, if it, a wholesale um, is formed with somebody being represented, um, but if not, then somebody's got to be represented in North Carolina. We've spat out some verbiage so far. Let's make sure we're hearing what I'm saying. The client is the one that's represented. The client is who you represent. They're the ones that you're gonna help, you're gonna help get through the transaction. The customer is the one that's unrepresented, the one that you don't represent. If they are your customer, you still owe them duties. Even though they didn't hire you, they may have even hired another agent. If they're your customer, we still owe them duties. And we're going to talk about those. We're going to do a good breakdown of what we owe our client, the one that chooses to be represented by us versus the customer who is not represented by us. And we have different duties for both. Yes, ma'am. How are they your customer if they're not your client? You become, that's a good question. Thank you. The reason how you become my client is because you hire me. You hire me by entering into an agency agreement with me. If you don't enter into an agency agreement with me, you're not my client. You are my customer. Okay, I think I understand. Thank you. And we're, and we're, we're just starting, right? So again, you guys, in unit eight, we get into, we're gonna look specifically at our agency agreements. So we can, we're actually gonna look at the form that we use to make you my client. We're going to use, look at the form that we use. The only way you can become my client is if you enter into an agency agreement with me. We have to enter into a relationship. Everybody else in the world is going to be my customer. I'm going to look at, I got a, uh, what would be an example of a customer? We're going to look at some examples in just one second. We're going to break this down for you in just one second. The client versus the customer. We work for the client. We work with the customer. Am I still involved in the customer? Sure. I'm not working for them. I'm not doing as instructed. It's the difference of walking side by side with somebody versus walking hand in hand versus taking their arm and escorting them. We're going to take our client's hand. We're going to pick them up and carry them if we need to, because that's what we do for our client. I'm going to walk beside my customer. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help them get to the end goal, but I'm not going to hold their hand and I'm certainly not going to pick them up. I have this image here of an airplane. My mentor uses an airplane when she's talking about client versus customer. And yes, she knows I use this. It's not, I'm not taking it from her. <laughs> she uses this image of an airplane. Let's pretend that you are the pilot of the plane. Isn't it your job to get the plane from point A to point B? Isn't it your job to get, that's what you do, right? You pilot a plan, plane. You, you fly it from here to here. That's a pilot's job. Your clients are going to ride in first class. When you put a client in a plane, they get first class service. Isn't, I hear first class is really nice. You get like 
a warm towel and maybe a meal and some champagne. It's nice in first class, I hear. You're gonna put your customers in coach. Are your customers still on the plane? Yeah. Do you still have a job to get your customers from point A to point B? Yeah. The difference in first class and coach is the level of service that you receive in between. Your clients are getting the champagne and the warm towel. Your customers are getting what? Lukewarm Coca-Cola and unsalted pretzels. They're getting a different level of service. They're not getting the same level as if they were in first class. So as we proceed and we talk about the client, we talk about the customer again, it's so important that we understand that I owe all consumers something. I owe everybody something. Once that consumer decides to hire me, once that consumer decides to enter into an agency agreement with me, I'm gonna upgrade them to first class. I'm gonna take them by the hand and I'm gonna escort them to first class and I'm gonna make sure they get that top level service. So we work for our clients, we work with the customer. Again, how do you become my client? You hire me. How do you hire me? We use an agency agreement that we'll talk about in these two units. So somebody requested some examples. So let's look at some examples. Who is the customer? Who is the client? If you represent somebody, they're your client, right? A client is represented. So if you represent the seller, that means your agency relationship is with the seller. That means your duty, your loyalty is to the seller. And in that transaction, because the seller is the one that hired you, the seller is your client, that's who you represent, your customer in that transaction is the buyer. Well, Julie, what if the buyer hires me? Well, now you're going to represent the buyer. Your duty, your loyalty, your purpose for waking up in the morning is to represent your buyer. And in that transaction, that would make the seller your customer. Now we're going to break down the different duties. What do I owe my client? What do I owe my customer? So if you represent just one party in the transaction, the other one, I'm getting there. The other one is your customer. Somebody just asks, what if you represent both? I can represent, there are situations where I can represent the buyer and the seller. That means in that transaction, I don't have a customer. I got two clients. Oh dear. Now I have two kings to serve. Does the king back in the day of England like that? Now it's getting tricky, right? That little line's getting fuzzy. We're going to talk about that. I owe a client level service to both. That transactional broker that we said is not allowed in North Carolina, that's a situation where you don't represent anybody. Both buyer and seller are your customer. And guess what you provide? Nothing. You can't do it. You can't be there. Again, if you're going to be involved in a transaction, if you want to get paid, let me put it in words we can understand. If you want to get paid, you've got to represent somebody, which means you have to be in an agency agreement with one or both of the parties. A customer considered a non-agency relationship. Nope, I don't like that terminology. So how long do we legally court the customer before the end of the relationship? No legalities, no legality. There's no, you're gonna work with buyers for two months or you're gonna work with sellers for you know six weeks. There's no time limit on things. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we form those relationships. Non-agency is our transactional broker. Again, if you're involved, you got to represent somebody. If you want to get paid, 
<laughs> and you want to keep your real estate license once you get it, you've got to represent somebody. You have to have at least one agency agreement for that transaction. Questions on things that we've talked about. If we haven't talked about it yet, we're getting there. Questions on things that we've talked about so far. So far, so good. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and take our break. When we come back, we're going to break down specifically, what duties do I owe my client and what duties do I owe my customer? So let's take 10.
all the way back. All right. Oh, you guys there? You guys there? Okay. I lag sometimes and I want to make sure I've been in cases before where I've just babbled on for like 20 minutes and y'all weren't there. So if I ever lag, I want to make sure it's caught up. I mean, I could stand here and talk to myself for 20 minutes, no problem, but uh, I'd rather have you guys with me. All right, <laughs> so let's take attendance. And... What we're going to do now, still on this um, conversation, this idea of the client and the customer. And what we're going to do now is break down the duties, the responsibilities that I have to each. So there are certain things that my client gets. There are things that my customer gets that they don't get that my client does. Remember, it's the difference of being in first class and coach. I'm still driving this plane where you don't drive a plane. I'm still flying this plane, right? And in order for me to be the pilot of the plane, somebody's got to be in first class. Do I have everybody so far? Somebody has to be a client for me to fly this plane. So let's talk, just first focus on the client, the duties that I owe the client. And the easiest way for us to remember are the duties that I owe my client is old car. Now we're going to break each of these down. Please don't worry. These are the duties that I owe my principal under the law of agency. Remember, it's comprised from common law of agency, license law and commission rule, court rulings. The law of agency says, if somebody hires you to assist them in a real estate transaction, this is what you owe them. You owe them old car. Enter camera. Yep, yep, good, good. Okay, so let's break down old car. Okay, the O in old car stands for obedience. I am to act in good faith at all times, obeying my principal's lawful instructions. Even though I owe them old car, even though they are my client, they still can't make me break the rules. And yeah, I mean, okay, we're talking about police rules, but specifically when we refer to lawful instructions, they can't make me violate license law and commission rule. So if the real estate commission says, this is what you do or do not have to do, even though I'm obedient, I'm gonna do whatever my principal tells me to do. I'm gonna follow their commands as long as it confines, as long as it relates to or is allowed by license law and commission rule. The real estate commission tells me what I can and can't do. Everybody with me? That's why they give you a license. That's why they allow you to be a real estate agent because you follow their law and rules. Again, you guys, the public has no idea what the real estate commission tells me I can and can't do. That's my job to know that. And that's what we're starting to get into. Uh, in this unit is talking about more about the law, more about the rules. You guys that just came back, are you telling me you're back? Okay, good. You too, yep. Okay, so I'm obedient. I act in good faith at all times. I follow their commands. I do as I'm advised, as I'm told. They're my boss. Let's think of the principal as my boss. When your boss tells you to do something to do, do you do it? Yeah. The principal is the boss. They're the ones that hire you. So I'm obedient. I also owe them loyalty. I'm placing their best interest above all others Sometimes that's even my own. 
I need to be sensitive to any conflicts of interest that may affect them. When you're working with buyers and sellers, we are, we owe them old car. We are representing them in this transaction. So with the sellers, are we helping them sell 123 Main Street? With the buyers, are we helping them buy 123 Main Street? And in this transaction, I need to avoid any conflicts of any interest, anything that might harm my client. For example, let's say I own property. Do you think real estate agents buy and sell property every day for their own personal use? <laughs> Absolutely. This is why some of you may be here getting your license. It's because you want to be able to represent yourself in the transaction. So let's say I own property and I decide to sell it. I'm representing myself, aren't I? I'm wearing multiple hats in this transaction. Not only am I the listing agent, but I'm also the seller. If I'm selling this property, do you think it would be in the buyer's best interest to hire me? If the buyer wanted to buy my house that I own, do you think it would be in their best interest? Can we see a conflict of interest there? Because old car says, I owe this loyalty and this obedience to my client. So the buyer hires me and I should have their best interest. But let's face it, you guys, whose best interest do I actually have? Mine, because I'm the owner of record. So is it in their best interest? No, it might be in yours because you'll get more money and you can get commission and da, 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 da. But as I said from the beginning, it's not about you. It's about them and what's best for them. Can I sell my own home? Can I represent myself? Of course. Can I buy a home and represent myself? Of course. I need to be sensitive to any conflicts of interest when working with the other side. So we are obedient, we are loyal. A question comes in, how could you be sensitive of representing both buyer and seller? Dual agency is when you work with both. We're getting there, I promise. Um, dual agency blurries that line. Dual agency definitely causes, how do you work with both equally? Um, we're gonna talk about that. So hang on to that. It gets tricky. So I'm obedient, I'm loyal. The D and O car says disclosure. I have a duty to keep my principal informed at all times about any fact that may influence their decision in this transaction. It's all about being hired to assist them in this transaction. So anytime I learn anything about, um, again, let's say I'm working with a seller. The seller hires the firm. The firm allows me to work with their seller. So I'm working with the seller. I learned something about the buyer that may affect my seller's decision. I've got to disclose that to them. That's where my loyalty is. It's not to the buyer. They didn't hire me. It's to the seller, the one that did. Uh, what if I learned something about zoning that could affect or wide roading that could have road widening, I said that backwards, road widening that could affect the value of the property. Don't I have a duty to tell my seller? Isn't that something that could affect their decision? So when we learn anything that may influence their decision, my clients expect that I share that with them. We are going to talk in this unit, we officially introduce you guys to material facts. We've kind of danced all around it. Uh, we'll probably, yeah, we're even gonna get to that today. So we will talk more about material facts. Uh, I'm getting questions about dual agency and I get it. I get that you have a lot of questions. Uh, truth is we probably won't get to that until next week. So just again, bear with me, bear with me. So let's break down this disclosure. Let's talk first, what if you're working with the seller? Specifically, what are some things that I need to disclose to my sellers? Well, as their agent, as the one that they hire, I have a duty to deliver all offers. Does that say most offers? 
Does that say only the good offers? Does that say the ones that we know that are gonna make it? But Julie, what if it's a lowball offer that's just gonna make them mad? Do I have to deliver that to them? Yes, because OCAR, because common law of agency says I deliver all offers. I'm not the one selling this house. I'm not the one that can make a decision about what offers good or bad. I provide the facts so they can make a decision. So if it's an insultingly low offer that's just gonna tick them off, do I have to present it? Yes. I had a seller a couple years ago. He told me, if you can't sell my, and I don't remember the exact number, so let's just kind of make numbers up. If you can't sell my house for less than 150, then I can't afford to sell. He was in that kind of position. Anything under 150, he'd have to bring money to the table. He didn't have money to take to the table. And he said, under 150, I can't afford to sell my house. And I appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you. Isn't that, that's a big trust thing he just shared with me, right? And when he told me that, didn't he expect that I kept that to myself? Or was I going to call all buyers and say, bring me an offer for 150, right? He shared that with me in confidence. He knew that he could trust me with that information. I explained to him, I appreciate what you're saying and I hear what you're saying. I need you to understand if I get anything under 150, I still need to share that with you because I can't make that decision. He said, got it, thanks, but I'm just letting you know. Perfect. Two weeks later, I get an offer for like 143. What do you think I did? You think I replied right away and said, sorry, we reject your offer? Or did I call my seller and say, hey, we got an offer. It's 143. He said, Julie, I can't do it. I said, have a nice day. Bye. That whole conversation was about 30 seconds. I still had to present it. Y'all, what if, let's play the what if game for a second. What if he told me he couldn't take under 150? I told you I didn't get that low ball offer until for two weeks. What if something changed in his financial situation last night and he had to sell no matter what? And then he found out I rejected that offer on his behalf. Do I have a happy seller? Not even a little bit. Have I violated my duty? Have I lost his trust? Absolutely. So when they tell you they can't take a lowball offer, I have learned in life, <laughs> if we can explain things up front, have these conversations up front, no, set the expectations. I told him, I hear what you're saying. If I get an offer for 150, I'm gonna call you. It'll take us 30 seconds and we're gonna go about our lives. Everybody good with that? So let's review. Which offers do I deliver to my sellers? Each and every single one of them. Is a verbal offer an offer? Is a verbal offer an offer? Yeah. Do I present verbal offers? Yeah. If it's verbal, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's not gonna hold up in a court of law. But do I have to present it? Yes because it is an offer. When we're working with sellers, um, if I find out that the, complete the transaction or offer, if the buyer is not offering uh, what they can offer, if I find out that the buyer can pay more, maybe I find out that the buyer is pre-approved for more than what they're offering. They send me a pre-approval letter, for example, with their offer. We're gonna talk about the pre-approval letter when we get into financing. But when the buyer submitted the offer, they sent a letter from the bank saying they're pre-approved for X amount. But what they're offering wasn't that amount. Don't I have a duty to tell my seller they can afford more? Don't I have a duty to tell my seller that even though this is what they're offering, they can or are willing to pay more? I also need to disclose to my seller if I find out the buyer's intention to sell it for a profit. If they are going to buy it and then turn around and sell it later and make money, maybe, for example, there is a proposed zoning amendment on the table. And if that zoning amendment passes, the values in the neighborhood are going to go up. And I find out that that's the buyer's plan. I want to buy it now, wait for the zoning amendment to pass, 
and then sell it at a higher value. If I find out, don't I have a duty to tell my seller, this is the buyer's plan. Again, you guys, please don't get bogged down with how are you gonna find out? It doesn't matter how I find out. Maybe I picked up the newspaper this morning and saw that. Maybe I heard it, you know, out on the streets. It doesn't matter how I find out. Once I find out, I have a duty to disclose that to my seller. We got to keep them informed in anything that relates to this transaction. In this case, anything that could affect them in selling 123 Main Street. When we're working with buyers, we have a duty to disclose any known deficiencies about the property. Are there problems with the property? Are there problems with the home? Yes. What are they? I don't know yet, but I know there's something wrong with that home. No such thing as a perfect house. As we start investigating, we're gonna learn things. Once we learn, what if some reason, um, let's see, any factors that may adversely affect the property's value? Um, what if, for example, I somehow learned why the seller is selling? Could motivation for selling affect the offer that the seller accepts? Some have to sell more quickly than others, right? When you're selling a house, I think it comes down to two different things, time versus money. If you have a lot of time, we may get you more money. But if you have to sell really, really fast, we may not get you as much money. Time versus money. And that's a good conversation to have with your sellers, right? Of course, why are you selling? But when you're a buyer's agent, if you find out why the seller is selling, I need to share that with my buyer. I need to disclose that to my buyer. This crazy market that we've been in, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. Um, we're coming out of it. We're starting to see signs of coming out of it. Um, but last year, last couple years, homes have been flying off the shelf. I feel bad for agents that got licensed two years ago. Because when you got your license two years ago, you don't know how to sell a house. Because for the last two years, all you've had to do is put a for sale sign in the yard and the dang thing sold itself. You didn't have to do open houses or advertising or price drops. All that stuff is starting to come back. And these that got licensed two years ago are gonna have to start learning, you know, how, how, how do you sell a house? We are probably on average, there was a time, we, call, we refer to it as days on the market. How many days was it on the market before a buyer made an offer? And probably a year ago, our average days on the market was like two or three days. Now we're starting to see seven days, 10 days. That's one of the signs that we're starting to see that we're coming out of this market. We're gonna get to a place where days on market might be 30 days, 60 days, right? So what's an average days on market? Well, it depends on the market and it varies, it fluctuates with the market. So let's just say, for example, right now the average days on market is 10 days. If you see a home that's been on the market for 30, don't you have reason to have a little flag go up? Maybe there's something wrong with this home. Maybe it's overpriced. I don't know, but I know in this market, it should be selling for sooner than 30 days. Isn't that a conversation I need to disclose to my buyer? Isn't some, that something that could affect the offer that they wanna make, the price that they wanna make? We are the experts of our market. So knowing the market, keeping up with the trends, knowing what these averages are, these are things that can help us in having these conversations with buyers and sellers. If the average days on the market is 10 days and it's been on the market for two and my buyer says, what should I offer? I'm probably gonna say at or more than asking price. It depends. If it's been on the market for 30 and my buyer says, what should I offer? Can I get them, maybe get them in a little bit under? You guys see what I'm saying? We understand our market. We study our market so we can best assist our buyers and sellers. 
Yeah, we're starting to see. So you were looking online and you saw price drops. I know we're starting to see price drops again. Um, <laughs> what's a price drop? I, I, I just finished a post licensing class yesterday and I was picking on them and I'm like, do y'all know what a price drop is? And they kind of rolled their eyes at me. But seriously, do we know what a price drop is? You know, we list it for this much and we don't have the activity we want. So now we reduce the price trying to attract those buyers. Another question comes in, does the listing agent have to disclose everything they know? And the answer to that is a big, loud, all caps, yes. I disclose what I know. And again, that, that's getting into that material fact discussion that we are, we're heading to. Questions on old, obedience, loyalty, disclosure. Uh, do we disclose commission split? No, it's nobody's business how much I make. We'll talk about commission. Well, with the seller we do, but we'll talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about car. The C in car is confidentiality. Whatever my principal tells me, stays between us. Guys, it's a relationship of trust. Did you ever tell somebody a secret and then you found out they told that secret? That ever happened to you? Did you trust that person going out afterwards? If they, if they violated your trust, did you go back and tell them another secret? No, that's not how trust works, is it? So when my principal tells me something that is about them in this transaction, anything that affects this transaction, I have a duty to keep my mouth shut unless I don't. We will talk about material facts in just a second. If my seller tells me why they wanna sell, for example, uh, maybe they're selling, maybe they say, Julie, we're getting to go through this big nasty divorce. The sooner we can sell, the better, so we can part ways and be apart from each other. Am I going to take that information and tell a buyer? Because what's a buyer hear when they hear that? A buyer hears time is more important to them, so let's make them a lower offer. So when my seller tells me why they're selling, that stays with me unless they give me permission to share. And what do we document? Everything. So when they say we're selling because we're relocating on my job and I say, can I share that? And they say, yeah, that's fine. Uh huh. I need to get that in an email or a text message. I need their permission in writing. When you guys start doing open houses, I can guarantee you you're always gonna get two questions in an open house. I can almost promise you. Question number one is why are they selling? And what I really want to say, it's really not your business, but I know this question's coming. So I go ahead and ask my sellers ahead of time. I'm doing your open house on Sunday. I know I'm going to be asked, why are you selling? Can I disclose that? If the seller says no, buyer asks the open house, I say, my seller doesn't wish to disclose that. I'm protecting what they shared with me. If they say, yeah, whatever, I don't care. Let's get this in writing. Let's get an email or text. Everybody with me? By the way, the second question you're going to get at an open house, does the refrigerator stay? So go ahead and have that conversation if the seller plans to take the refrigerator or not. Go ahead and give that out. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about death or murder in homes. Yep, we're getting there when we get to material facts. Um, so yep, we're getting there as well. I had sellers um they were for sale by owner they attempted to go on their own for like five six months and they weren't getting this results that they wanted so they hired me and and this was a different market this is before the market that we're in right now where things are selling in like 10 days so this was a couple years ago and we were on the market for like two weeks I was on the market for two weeks 
And she called me so frustrated. I can't believe and da da da. And I thought, we've only been at this for two weeks. What is wrong with this woman? And then I remembered, I've only been at it two weeks. She's been at it for six and a half months. We're in two different places, aren't we? We are in two totally different places. So while I'm just getting started, she's been there, done that, and over it. And she said, she said, can you put in the public remarks that we are, how'd she say it? Super highly motivated sellers. I said, no, I'm not, I'm, mm, mm, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I will put that you're motivated sellers. I'm, I'm not gonna throw you under the rug like that. I will put that you're motivated sellers. Let's think about this for a second. Aren't all sellers motivated? They got a sign in the yard. They have a reason to sell, right? So aren't all sellers motivated? What do you think when they say they are motivated, when they disclose that they are motivated. Now what we think as buyers is, bring me anything, we'll work with it. It doesn't have to be asking price, bring me something. Wouldn't that be something that would be confidential information unless I have permission to share? So I said, I'm not putting super highly motivated, I'm not gonna do it. I will put motivated seller once you send me an email, giving me permission to do that. My seller that told me he couldn't accept under 150, that was confidential information. Unless he shared permission, I can't, everybody with me? That's why they hire us. They think they can trust us. They think that we're gonna keep their secrets confidential. So here's the deal. You tell your client everything you know about your customer. You tell your customer nothing about your client without their permission. You tell your client everything about the customer. Everything you learn about the customer, again, I don't care how you learn it. Once you learn something about your customer involved in this transaction, you share that with your client. You tell your customer nothing about your client unless you have their permission. And actually, I'm going to take that a step further to protect y'all and say, unless you have their written permission. Because what do we document? Everything. Uh, when I say customer, I'm referring to the person that didn't hire me. So in this scenario, the seller's my client because they hired me. The buyer would be my customer, whether or not they have an agent or not. That agent, that buyer are my customer, treated like my customer. You become my client because you hire me. And how you hire me is by entering into an agency agreement with me. When buyers and sellers have agents, maybe it's you, maybe it's not. When buyers and sellers have agents, we are treated as one of the same. So as a listing agent, I'm treated as a seller. As a buyer's agent, I'm treated as the buyer. So we're keeping everybody's secrets. Again, you guys, it's about this transaction. We're not gossiping. If I learn something about the buyer that doesn't have anything to do with this transaction, I'm not gonna call them, did you hear what they said? We're not gossiping. It's about whether or not it has something to do with this transaction? Is it going to affect their decision as it relates to this transaction? The A in car is accounting. I have to account for all funds received on or behalf of my principal. At some point in the transaction, you probably will have somebody else's money in your hand. You're just acting as delivery man. You're acting as courier, getting it from point A to point B. But when you have somebody else's money in your hand, it is your responsibility. My suggestion, get it to where it needs to go. Get it delivered. Don't hang on to it. Why? Get it to where it needs to go. We're going to look at um, closing disclosures in Unit 21. Closing disclosures are the breakdown. Um, the buyer's closing disclosure tells them how much money they have to bring to closing. 
The seller's closing disclosure tells them how much money they're gonna get from the sale of their home. Part of my duty under old cars to make sure that their numbers are accurate, to make sure that their numbers are right. Wouldn't that be a good duty that I'd owe you? Make sure that your numbers are right? The consumer doesn't know how to look at those numbers. They don't know how to add up all those numbers. We need to help them account for their end results, their end numbers. Again, that's all stuff we'll get. We're gonna go to closing in unit 21. I like unit 21. Closing day is a good day. We also have a duty to maintain accurate records. I got a license law and commission rule that says we keep everything, all records for three years, at least three years. Does that mean I can keep them for more than three years? Yes, I have to keep all records related to the transaction for at least three years. So our agency agreements, our contract paperwork, our closing paperwork, all correspondence in between, emails, texts. We keep everything for three years. That three year clock starts at the end of the transaction. So whenever this relationship is over, which we will talk about, that's when my three year clock starts. So I account for all their funds, their monies, I keep their records. And then the R is kind of the catch all. I have a duty, I owe them this reasonable skill, care, and diligence. Your future real estate license says that you have the ability to assist anybody in a real estate transaction, residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural, and you can work with sales, leases, buyers, sellers, landlords, tenants, you can help anybody in real estate as long as the property is located in the state of North Carolina. So if the property address is North Carolina, can I assist them in that brokerage transaction? The entire state of North Carolina. Yeah, that's what my license says. Reasonable skill, care, and diligence says, maybe I not tackle the whole state. Maybe I only focus on the markets and the areas that I'm willing to work. If my cousin wants to buy a house in Wilmington, could I assist my cousin in buying a house in Wilmington according to my license? Yeah, that's what my license says I can do. Reasonable skill, care, and diligence says, should I? Am I familiar with the Wilmington market? Am I willing to drive to Wilmington every time my cousin needs an agent present? That's a decision for you to make. I can't answer that question. If you're willing to tackle the state of North Carolina, you got to be familiar with and willing to go to all four corners of the state of North Carolina. Everybody with me? Reasonable skill, care, and diligence says just because I can doesn't always mean that I should. You get on the interstate this afternoon. Speed limit says 65. How fast do you drive? Come on. It says 65. What are we doing? 80, I hear you. <laughs> Most of us are going faster than 65, right? Does that make it okay? Cause that's what you're doing? Cause your car allows you to go 80. Does that make it okay? No, just cause you can, doesn't mean that you should. And reasonable skill, care, and diligence says that I need to do only the things that I reasonably can. Guys, I've been at this for 21 years, and I have very, very little commercial experience. My commercial experience is the back end, the administrative end of it. I know nothing personally about commercial sales or lease transactions. So if I get the call to help somebody in a commercial transaction, does my license say I can? Can I help them? Sure. Is it in their best interest? Maybe I can find somebody to team up with, right? They can show me the ropes and help me through it. But if I can't, if I don't know anybody, 
it's in their best interest that I refer them. Back to my cousin in Wilmington. It's in their best interest that I refer them to an agent. Can I get paid a referral fee? Heck yeah, heck yeah. As long as you have an active license, referral fees, the easiest money you'll ever make. Linda, this is Bob, Bob, this is Linda. At the end of the transaction, you got a check. So I'm only doing things that I reasonably could. Uh, let's break this down. Let's see, I had a question. Let me come back into this, I apologize. Is there a form you can use where the person receiving the money signs that they have received it? Yes, there's a form for that. Uh, for example, if you deliver a due diligence check, can the seller sign saying that they received it from you? Absolutely. And we will actually look at that when we look at our contract in unit 10. Because am I going to want to document that I delivered it? And I'm going to want to document that I dropped it off at the appropriate place? Absolutely. So is there a form for that? Yes. Good question. Thank you. So let's break down this reasonable skill, care, and diligence a little bit further. What is this reasonable skill, care, and diligence that we owe to the seller? Well, the seller may look at you and say, how much should I list my house for? Are you just going to blurt a number out? Are you just going to throw something out there? I mean, you could make more money if you list it for more. Is that what's in the best interest of the seller? Well, if you list it too high, it's probably not going to sell. So nobody's making any money, right? We are going to learn how we can advise the seller on an appropriate listing price. We'll get into that conversation in unit 17. Uh, we're not just skim, we're not just going to blurt a number out. We're going to do some research. We're going to help them find the facts so they can make an informed decision. Um, reasonable skill, care, and diligence owed to our seller. Any facts that the buyer would aid in the seller in making a decision about the buyer. Um, helping them advertising the property. What platforms are you going to advertise? Social media, of course. Let's take that one off the table. Are there other platforms you're going to help the seller sell? Um, are you going to um, do an open house, for example? We're going to assist the seller in helping them understand the terms of their offer. So when an offer comes in, we're not just gonna send it to them and say, here you go, let me know how to respond. They don't know, that's my job to know. So we're gonna have conversations. This is what they're offering. This is the details of the offer. This is what it looks like. Well, Julie, what should I do? I'm not the one selling this house. Would I accept this offer? It doesn't matter. My financial situation is different than yours. My reason for selling is different than yours. It's worth saying again, this isn't about you. This is about what's best for them. And when we have an offer come in, we need to help them accept the best offer for them. We are so familiar with our contract that we can help them translate the terms of that offer. Do they want to counter offer it? Do they want to accept that? All anything offer and contract related is what we're going to do in nine and 10. So seven and eight is all about agency. Nine and 10 is all about contracts. And I may have mentioned something about the importance of units seven and eight and nine and 10. You'll hear me say it 50 more times between now and the end of November, I promise. What about when you're working with the buyer? The buyer finds the one. They walk in the front door, they go, holy crow, this is my dream house. How much should I offer? Again, are you just gonna blurt a number out? Are you just gonna assume that the listing price is the best price? I hope not. Let's do some research for them. Let's do some um, proper investigation, help them determine what is the best offer price. Again, helping buyers and sellers determine price, things we get into in unit 17. Buyers like to look at you and say, is, is, is the seller going to accept that offer? Well, I don't know. All I know is we present our offer, see how they respond. As long as my buyer feels good about their offer, I feel good about their offer. 
I've received low ball offers before. And the buyer's agent calls me apologizing for the offer. Is that the best way to represent your buyer? No. If it's a low ball offer, you present that, that like this is the best dang offer you've ever seen because that's how you represent your buyer. Yeah, they call me. I'm getting ready to send you an offer and I'm so sorry, but this is all they were willing to do. So if you'll just run it by your sellers and let us know. Are you kidding me? Is that how you represent your client? Is that how you treat your principal? Is that how you treat your boss? You call them and say, I'm sending you an offer and we can't wait to hear your response. And you act, like I said, like it's the best dang offer that was ever presented, that was ever offered. That's your duty. We're gonna help our buyers find suitable properties. One of the first things we typically do with buyers is have a conversation with them. What are you looking for? Is there a certain style of home you like? Do you need a number of bedrooms, square footage, garage, land? Try to help them pinpoint the various things. I always have my buyers do a wants and needs list. These are the things you want. These are the things you need. I've learned a couple things over the years. First off, if you have a married couple, it's not uncommon for those wants and needs lists to look differently. Sometimes I wonder how the heck I'm gonna get both of them under the same roof, because I got them describing two different homes. Do I gotta get them on the same page? Yeah. The other thing I've learned over the years, wants and needs change. As we go out and start looking at property, as we start getting into homes, things change. We got to be prepared to flow with the changes. We got to be able to prepare. Some buyers don't honestly know what they're looking for until you get them out and show them a couple properties, until you get them in a front door so they can see some things. We're going to help our buyers with financing. Get them to a lender. Have them get a pre-approval from a lender. Do that before you start showing them property. Why are you showing them property they can't afford? Not only are you wasting their time, guess who else's time you're wasting? <laughs> Yours. So have them get to a lender, secure financing. If they're a cash buyer, great. We don't need a lender. And they wanna see a proof of funds. So again, I know we're not out wasting our time. We will talk about financing. Uh, I actually got two units dedicated to financing, 14 and 15. And then we're gonna assist our buyers in presenting their offers. Um, when we start looking at our contracts, um, we're gonna help them. How much do you wanna offer? When do you wanna close? Do you wanna ask for a home warranty? Our contract allows us to fill it in per our buyer's wishes. And once we fill it in on behalf of our buyer, then we're gonna present it and we're gonna do it in a positive way. Don't call the listing agent apologizing for your buyer's offer. Things that make my eye twitch. For both buyer and seller, we need to be familiar with the market that we're gonna work. We owe them that. Guys, Houses come and go. It's the market, it's the neighborhood that I'm selling. So we need to be familiar with it. What's the zoning? What are the schools? Uh, what's the highway, the roads? Help educate them. I'm telling you, one of the best tools for buyers, if they wanna know what's around the house they're thinking about buying, Google. Send them to Google, let them look at Google Maps, zoom out. They can see the proximity of the home they're thinking about buying to the highway or the landfill. We are the experts of the market that we choose to work. So G. Julie, what's the big deal? What if I don't wanna practice reasonable skill, care, and diligence? Well, you're facing some consequences. Uh, the Real Estate Commission could determine you guilty of negligence or misconduct. 
you could be liable to your principal for any damages. If they lost money in the transaction because of your negligence, they can come after you in a court of law. Remember you guys, the real estate commission is not gonna fine you. They're gonna regulate, discipline your license. Can the injured party, put real estate aside for a second. Can an injured party hire an attorney to sue somebody? Sure. And in real estate, if you harm your principal, cost them unnecessary money because of your negligence, your act, can they hire an attorney and sue you? Yeah. Are they going to win? I don't know. But can they? Yeah, you could be liable. Your negligence may not also cost you money, but it may prevent you from your commission. This is another good reason to be familiar with law and rule, yes? And then any violation, LL and CR is license law and commission rule. Everybody good if we LLCR going forward? License law and commission rule, all from the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. Any violation of our license law and commission rule could be a disciplinary action on our license. We will talk more about that disciplinary action uh, probably next week. So let's look at an example together. Colin is a buyer's agent. Colin gets a request from his buyer to see a property that is 200 miles outside of his geographical area. He normally provides services. Can Colin show this buyer the property? Can he, as long as it's located in North Carolina, can he? Yeah. Should he? I, I don't know, I'm not Colin. Is Colin willing to drive 200 miles one way to provide the services? Is Colin willing to do that? If not, reasonable skill, care, and diligence says Colin needs to refer it. If you live in Winston and the idea of Greensboro is thousands of miles away from you, you may want to just consider focusing on Winston. If you don't mind driving from Winston to Greensboro, then you can open up everybody with me. You have to decide how far you're willing to go. You have to decide what you consider reasonable. Do not take on this buyer knowing there's no way you're going to, you're just going to go once and show the property and you're done, right? No, we're assisting this buyer. Anytime that buyer wants to see that property, we're going with them. So are you willing to do that? And I can't answer that for you guys. That's something you need to ask yourselves. Um, I'll tell you in the height of my sales career, I had nine things under contract at once. And that's a lot. Uh, thank God I'm on a team. It takes a village and my team is <laughs> that village. So I had help. I didn't do it alone. But I had something under contract in Witsit, Witsit outside of Burlington. I had something under contract in Clemens and the other seven were in between. That's a heck of a span, isn't it? When I came out of that nine contract fog, they all closed. And when I came out of that, I decided I needed to tighten my market a little bit because that one day I had to drive from High Point to Witsit, Witsit to Clemens, and then back. You know how much time I spent on the road that day? That's a decision. Does that make sense? I had to make that decision. And that's what you all need to do too. Can you drive more than 65 miles per hour? Yes. Should you? That's for you to decide. Questions, comments? By the way, that year, that entire year I closed, I think 26 transactions. That was a big year. I was a top producer of my firm that year. That was it, <laughs> that was the height. <laughs> Shortly after that, I started this teaching thing, which now divvied my time up some. It's a lot. My question to you is, are you prepared to take that work on? If nine is too many, then you need to back off. If nine is not enough, then you do more. You guys have got to set your pace. You guys have got to set your speed. I get it when you first get your license, you're hungry and you're gonna wanna work with anybody. 
But as time goes on, as your business and your career starts to grow, you may choose to specialize. You may choose to find a niche. Remember not to put your cart in front of your horse. Before you worry about what your niche is, worry first about getting your license. Fair enough? All right. Questions on old car? Old car is what I owe my client. They hire me expecting me to do these things. They hire me with this expectation. Yes, ma'am. I figured it'd be quicker, quicker this way. So if, if you're a realtor and um, you have a, a client who is interested in purchasing a home, but they have not um, been pre-approved. Now, when you said about referrals, because you said you can still get paid if you referrals, did you also mean like if you refer that customer to a broker? Or like let me, a... let me clarify. If okay. you're referring somebody, you don't get paid until it closes. So if they can't afford to buy the house and you refer them to somebody, they still can't afford to buy the house, right? And unfortunately, yeah. that kind of takes, that's a very good point that you bring up. Guys, we are a commission-based industry, which means I typically don't get paid unless it closes. So if it closes, I don't get paid. So if I refer it, I'm not going to get paid just for referring it. And I apologize if I, um, I probably misled you a little bit there, so I'm sorry. So if I refer my cousin to an agent in Wilmington, I'm only going to get paid a referral fee when that agent in Wilmington sells my cousin's house. We're okay. a transaction, a commission-based industry. Okay, thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for, for clarifying me. Anything else on old car? Again, you guys, please, please don't worry. I, I will get you paid as long as it closes. I will get you paid. So I don't want y'all fretting about that. Fretting. So my grandma's words. Don't fret. All right. Let's take a break. Let's take 10. Uh, we come back. We're going to talk about what is it that we owe our customer.
Okay. We're back. Let's take attendance. So we have uh, talked about old car. Uh, old car is what we owe our clients. So let's just go back for a second. You become my client because you hire me. How do you hire me? You enter into an agency agreement with me. People have choices. Do they have to hire you? Do they have to? No, absolutely not. If they choose to hire you, what do we owe them? What's our thank you? We owe them old car. I can't violate their trust. And thank you guys, I see you guys coming back. Thank you for telling me you're back. Please make sure you, you do so. I can't violate their trust. I owe them that. Guys, they're the boss. They are the boss. So we need to make sure that we are doing, again, within their lawful instructions. And we will help break down that lawful as we go on and continue to learn more and more about license law and commission rule. So everybody's good. If you ever have to ask yourself, gee, this is my principal, I wonder what I owe them, we can easily remember old car. I need you guys to spend time with old car this weekend. I need you guys to spend time with agency because we need to have a very good understanding about what I owe my principal, what I owe my boss. There is more to know. We're just scratching surfaces in this class. I'm not teaching you everything there is to know about agency in this class. We're helping you get your license so then you can go on and not only start working with buyers and sellers, but get further education. You guys remember at the first day of class, we said that post-licensing is required. So once you get your license, you have 90 additional hours to do. And we break that post-licensing down into three 30-hour courses. And one of those post-licensing classes is brokerage relationships and responsibilities, which is just a really fancy way of saying agency. So once we introduce you to these topics, once we introduce you to these ideas, so you have enough information that you need to get your license, then you take post-licensing and learn more, and your firm will continue training, should, may continue training as well. Um, so we'll talk kind of what firms and how you guys can decide what firm to work for and all that good stuff. But what I want you guys to understand right now is this is just the start of your agency training. And your agency training will for, continue for as long as you decide to have a real estate license. Everybody with me? I know agency pops up in our continuing education from the Real Estate Commission every once in a while. You guys are not leaving this call today as an expert in agency. It's just not gonna happen. But the way you wrap your brain around it, the way you better understand it is you spend time with it, you review it, you study it, you look at the book, you look at the video, you do the quizzes. It all starts here. So we owe our client old car. Again, how do you become my client? You hire me. How do you hire me? We enter into an agency agreement. Do I have everybody so far? So if you're not my client, you're my customer. Am I gonna leave you off to the side of the road? No. Even if you're my customer, I still owe you certain duties. And if you are my customer, I owe you honesty. I never have a reason to lie to you. I owe you fairness. I still got to treat you fairly. And we owe everybody, client and customer, the disclosure of material facts. We will get started on material facts today. We may or may not get through it. 
Um, but we will start introducing you to what we mean by these material facts. Like I said, we've been dancing all around it for a couple of classes now. Uh, so we're going to full on uh, direct it. Have a good weekend. We will full on direct it in just a minute. The client gets old car. The customer gets honesty, fairness, and the disclosure of material facts. Remember you guys, the client is the one that I am walking hand in hand in. The client is the one that I may even pick up and carry every once in a while. The customer and I are walking side by side and I'm not carrying them, I'm not holding their hand. I'm still assisting them, helping them through the transaction, but they're not getting that same level of service as what my client does. Everybody is a customer until they become a client. Until or if, I should say, they become a client. In dealing with customers and being honest and fair, this also applies to our advertising. And here's a fancy word for us. I'm on page 142. Puffing is an opinion. It's my opinion. There's a very fine line between puffing and misrepresentation. I'm allowed to puff. I'm allowed to exaggerate. If I want to put a house for sale and tell you embellish all the great details, if I think this is the best house on the block, that's puffing, right? That's just my opinion. Could you come in and have a different opinion? Could you think that there's a better house on the block than one that I thought? What I can't say is this is the only house on the block unless it is. We, when we write our remarks, we like to um, use lots of adjectives and fancy words to draw a picture. And when we're writing those remarks, we need to be very careful. Puffing is allowed, lying is not. Misrepresentation is not. So if your puffing starts getting way too fancy, let's say, for example, let's look at our picture here. And let's say, for example, you are listing this house. Can I say near the ocean? Yeah. Can I say good view of the ocean? Yeah. Can I say oceanfront property? No, because what happens if somebody comes in and buys this piece of land and builds a house? You can't see the ocean now, can you? So I can say, does it currently have a great view of the ocean? Sure, sure. But is it oceanfront? Is it ocean view? You guys kind of see what I'm saying? So we need to just be very careful. Uh, you guys, as soon to be new agents, may want to and your firm may require you to run your marketing by them before you release it to the public. Make sure that it's good, make sure that it's accurate and make sure that you're not engaging and misrepresenting the property, a flat out lie. Okay. So let's talk about material facts. By the way, everything you're looking at is the top of page 143. I prefer you guys to listen, um, knowing that all these words are at the top of page 143 and you have my PowerPoint. So let's talk now about material facts. And we're gonna spend a quite a bit of good amount of time on this slide. Material facts is actually a very, very broad definition. The broad definition of a material fact says it's a fact that a reasonable person would recognize as relevant when making a decision to buy or sell. Doesn't that leave us a lot of holes? What's a reasonable person? What's a relevant? What is relevant? So the Real Estate Commission helped us. They said that definition, that broad definition is not helpful. It doesn't do any good. So the Real Estate Commission offered us specifics. 
help us narrow down about things that are relevant to this transaction. The Real Estate Commission says that a material fact is any fact about the property itself. Do we have structural damage? Is there termite damage? Does the roof leak? Does the basement flood? Does the electrical have issues? If you were a reasonable person, would you consider that relevant? Would you wanna know that the basement flooded before you bought a house? I hope so. Would you wanna know that there's a big crack in the foundation and we have structural issues? We're referring to things that are facts specifically about the property itself. A material fact could also be a fact relating directly to the property. Maybe it's not something about the property itself, but it's something surrounding the property. For example, a proposed zoning amendment. If we're gonna change the zoning, isn't that relevant to the property? Couldn't that affect negatively or positively the value of the property? It's not about the property, but it's directly related to the property, it's surrounding the property. Um, planned highway construction. DOT is gonna come in within the next three years and do a road widening project. Is that something you would consider relevant when you're buying a house? Would you wanna know that your two lane road is soon gonna be a three lane or a five lane road? Absolutely. It's not about the property itself, but it relates directly to the property. A material fact is one that relates directly to the ability of your principal to complete the transaction. This is one of these where confidentiality doesn't matter. If you find out that your client cannot buy or sell, we have got to disclose that. Let's say, for example, you put your buyer under contract, you have a pre-approval letter. I need everybody to understand a pre-approval is not a guarantee. It is a pre-guarantee. There's still processes and steps to go to get approval. We will talk about financing. But you have a pre-approval letter, you get your buyer under contract, and then you find out your buyer's not gonna get loan approval. Could that be embarrassing for your buyer to learn that they don't get loan approval, to learn that the bank won't give them the money that they need to buy that house? But guys, that affects your buyer's ability to complete the transaction. So do I have to disclose to the seller that the buyer can't get loan approval? Yes. This negates the confidentiality thing because it affects their ability to complete the transaction. What if you're the listing agent and you find out after you list the property, maybe you're under contract, maybe you're not, but you find out after you list the property that your seller is in foreclosure or bankruptcy. Could that affect their ability to sell? If they're gonna lose their home to the bank, it's no longer theirs to sell, is it? They've lost the property. That is a material fact that we have to disclose. So when your seller looks at you and says, I'm in bankruptcy, it may not be my property at the end of this bankruptcy hearing, Shh, don't tell anybody. That's a material fact I can't keep to myself because it affects whether or not they can or cannot sell. I think this third one is the most difficult one for us to wrap our brains around because I just got done babbling on about how we owe confidentiality and we keep our mouth shut and da 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 da. But if it's something that negatively affects them and their ability to complete this transaction, I have got to disclose it. We have got to share that with the other party. Usually with this third bullet point, um, as the example is just indicated, it tends to revolve around financing which means the buyer's inability to purchase or the seller's inability to sell. This last one is a material fact for me and you. I'm not running around and put this in my advertising. I'm not telling the other party. This is a material fact for me 
the real estate agent. When I'm working with buyers and sellers, I operate by a very simple philosophy. If it's important to my client, then it's important to me. Once my client shares something of a specific importance to them, then it becomes a material fact to me. If my buyer says, I can't live in an area that is near a highway, do I now have something of specific importance? Do I now have a duty to make sure that my buyer's future home isn't across the street from a highway? That's kind of a random example, I know. If it's something of importance to them, then by default, it becomes importance to me. Guys, please remember, I'm kind of like an extension of them, aren't I? What if, I think we gave this example last week, what if your buyer tells you that they want to be able to convert their garage into a hair salon? Is that something of specific importance to me? You better believe it. Now I got a duty to check zoning to make sure zoning will allow them to have a hair salon. Now I have a duty to check the covenants if we're in an HOA to make sure that it's allowed. Anytime we learn, once our parties say, this is something that's important to me, it becomes important. Again, this is a material fact. I'm not gonna call a seller and say, my buyer has to buy a house. It's not a material fact. You have a cat. It's not a material fact <laughs> that sometimes cats walk across keyboards. I think I just got that message. It's not a material fact to the other party that my buyer wants to convert the garage into a hair salon. It's a material fact to me. I now have a duty to find them that house if they convert the garage into a hair salon. Does that kind of make sense? Here's the deal about material facts. We always have a duty to disclose material facts. I do not care who I am talking to. Am I talking to the client or am I talking to the customer? It doesn't matter. I always have a duty to disclose material facts. If I may word that another way, I never have a reason not to disclose material facts. If you learn, you take on a new listing and you learn that the roof leaks. I don't care how you learn it. You take on a listing and you learn that the roof leaks when it rains. Even if your seller doesn't want to disclose that, remember caveat emptor says the seller doesn't have to disclose. License law and commission rule says we do. So remember when we met old car, I said, I am loyal to my principles lawful instructions. When your seller looks at you and says the roof leaks when it rains, shh, don't tell anybody. That is not a lawful instruction. I have, I, I've got to disclose. And yes, I'm having that conversation up front. Yes, my seller knows very early in our relationship that I have a duty to disclose material facts. Be very careful what you tell me. Because whatever you share with me, if it's a material fact, I have a duty to disclose that. I think when listing a property, material facts between the listing agent and the seller are probably the biggest time that we're going to butt heads. Because the seller thinks that you aren't going to run around blab that their roof leaks. But the real estate commission says we always have a duty to disclose material facts. So how do we handle this with our sellers? We have these conversations up front. We set the expectations up front. We tell them up front, this is my duty. This is my loyalty. This is what I owe you. This is what I have to do. At the end of unit seven, we will get into our disclosure, our agency disclosure, how I disclose my agency status, how I make sure that I'm having these conversations. We're getting there. We will talk more about this. Uh, is there a process to the documentation of material facts? And I'm going to say no. I'm just going to say document it. And the reason I say no is because I may learn about a material fact before I ever list the property. 
I may learn about a material fact while I have it listed. I may learn about it when we go under contract, right? It doesn't matter when I learn about what phase I learn about a material fact. I always have a duty to disclose material fact. There are some things that the North Carolina Real Estate Commission has specifically said, these things are always material facts. So in other words, there are specific things that the commission has said, if and when you come across it, it's not a question of, should I disclose this or not? The Real Estate Commission says, if and when you come across it, there are things that will always be considered a material fact that we have to disclose. So if you guys please will look at me, look with me on page 143. You guys see that paragraph right under the bullets that start with some issues have been declared. You guys see in this paragraph. So let's break this paragraph down and talk about these things to make sure that we're good with things that are always considered material fact. You don't have to ask yourself, do I need to disclose that? According to the commission, the answer is yes. First thing we have here is synthetic stucco, also known as EFIS. Stucco is a type of exterior siding. If you see a home clad in stucco, I tend to think of like Spanish style homes. The siding, the stucco kind of looks like concrete. It's real rough. It's not vinyl, it's not brick. It looks like concrete. Synthetic stucco then is fake stucco. If the home has ever been clad in synthetic stucco, that will always remain a material fact on the property. Even if it's been fixed, it will always remain a material fact on the property. That's one thing, one exception to the seller's disclosures. If they've treated the ethos, if they've treated the synthetic stucco, that's something that will remain with the property. We always have to disclose that. Um, if the residence has ever had leaking polybutylene pipes, polybutylene pipes are just a cheap pipe product. They're like plastic, they're white. Usually you can see some blue writing on it, a little bit of blue numbers. Polybutylene pipes, because of the material that they're built in, I don't think they were designed to last forever. And eventually they're gonna leak. If they ever leak and they've been fixed, once they leak, they become a material fact on the property forever. Um, you'll learn more about it. You'll see it. it you won't have to show many homes to see polybutylene pipes. Please note there that it says leaking. It doesn't say if it's not leaked yet. It just says if they have leaked that will remain a material fact. And then the last one here, if the property was ever the site of a meth lab. The problem with cooking meth is that the fumes and the chemicals get into the walls and the floors and the ceilings. So if the property was ever been the site of a meth lab, we have got to disclose, even if it's been cleaned up and re remediated, I get a lot of questions about this meth lab thing. So just hang on just a dang second, okay? Everybody stop typing. I see you guys in the chat going, oh my God. Okay, stop. There's an article that the Real Estate Commission put out not too terribly long ago about listing properties, their sites of meth labs, dealing with meth lab listings, that kind of thing. And I just took that article and I put it in Learn Test Pass for you. So everything you've ever wanted to know about listing a meth home is in Learn Test Pass. So check that out in Unit 7 material. Guys, remember, part of my duty is to help my buyers and sellers investigate, help them learn, help them gather facts. And again, even if I'm the listing agent, if I'm the listing agent, I'm working with the seller, the seller has hired my firm to assist them. And even though the seller is our client, even though the seller has our old car, I still have a duty to disclose material facts to the buyer customer. 
The seller doesn't have to disclose. Why? Caveat mTOR. The real estate agent does. Why? License law and commission rule. I don't get to hide under the cover of caveat mTOR. That's only an option for my seller. Do I have everybody? I do what the real estate commission tells me to do. What do they tell me to do? Disclose material facts. I always, no matter if I'm talking to a client or a customer, go back, let's go back just for one second. What do I owe my customers? Honesty, fairness, and what's that third bullet point? The disclosure of material facts. I always have a duty to disclose. So I got a couple questions. How do you know if it's a meth lab? We ask questions. Sometimes you can smell it. Read that article from the commission. All your questions about meth will be answered from the realist, from the article I got, Learn Test Pass. Uh, does the listing agent have to look out for red flags? Yes, absolutely. With the listing agent, it's not just a matter of disclosing, it's a matter of discover and disclose. If I have a red flag go up, that prompts me to discover, that prompts me to investigate, ask questions. You can't hide your head in the sand. We've got to be constantly on the lookout for those red flags. Some material facts may be latent. And I always feel like we don't hear this word because I know my accent sometimes gets in the way. So the word I'm saying right now is latent. A latent defect in the property is a hidden. It's not obvious. It's not been discovered yet. I can only disclose what I should reasonably know. I can't be responsible for latent defects. Now, the real estate commission may say, could Julie have found out? Could she have asked some questions? Could she have investigated? So just because it's late doesn't mean you're out, or just because it's not obvious, it doesn't mean out. But the question is, could you have found out? Could the agent have found out? Asking questions, digging a little deeper. Let's say, for example, I got um, faulty electrical in this wall. I have no idea unless I know, right? I don't know what I don't know. So if I don't walk in this room and smell electrical, or if I don't see my little outlet down here, you know, charring up, turn up. I have no reason to suspect there's faulty electrical behind this wall. That would be a latent effect until it causes some kind of fire and comes out. I can't be responsible for disclosing what I don't know. I do have a duty to investigate. I do have a duty to address red flags. So let's look at an example. Sarah is a listing agent. She's performing a listing presentation for Mark. During Sarah's walkthrough of the property, she notices a stain on the ceiling. Can you look up and see a stain? Can you see a water stain on the ceiling? So what does she do? She has a flag go up and she asks Mark about the stain. Mark babbles on about how the roof has a leak, has been repaired three times, it needs to be replaced. And then Mark goes on a step further, says that's one of the reasons why he wants to sell. That's his motivation for selling is because he doesn't want to put a new roof on the property. Then he looks at Sarah and says, shh, don't tell any prospective buyers. I'll paint it one more time before you list and nobody will ever know. Does Sarah now know that the roof leaks? Does Sarah now know that it's an ongoing issue? Mark didn't do anything wrong. Mark is protected as the seller under caveat and tour. I have a feeling where Sarah went wrong in this transaction is she failed to tell Mark, I have a duty to disclose. Before we walk around with our sellers and learn about the property, we need to have this conversation. Isn't that fair to the seller? 
Mark, when I see something that causes a red flag, I have a duty to ask. And whatever I learn, I have to disclose. It's all about setting the expectations, you guys. Don't blindside Mark. Don't let Mark spill all his beans about all the problems in the house and then say, oh, I have to tell everybody, sorry, should have told you that first. <laughs> Don't blindside Mark. Set the expectations with Mark. Before we walk around and take the tour of your home and you start pointing out all the problems, you need to know that my licensed law and commission rule says that I have a duty to disclose material facts. Um, what if Mark painted before I got the Sarah got there? What if Sarah never saw the, the, st the stain? She can't disclose what she doesn't know. That's where Mark went wrong. He should have painted before she got there. What if you list the property and then the stain appears? Does your flag go up? Are you starting to ask Mark some questions? Absolutely. Let's reverse this. Let's say you're the buyer's agent and you and your buyer are walking through Mark's house and you walk into this room and you, the buyer's agent, see a water stain on the ceiling. And you're gonna say, oh, look, there's a water stain. And your buyer looks at you and says, where's that, where, how'd that get there? Where'd that come from? Are you a roofer? Are you a plumber? Can you give an expert opinion on where that water stain came from? No, we're just an agent, guys. My job is to disclose information. If the buyer wants to know where that water stain came from, we need to encourage them to investigate further. Let's see what's up there. Is there plumbing? Is there a roof? Is there, you know, what's going on up there? Um, where does the roof leak? Let's call a roofer and find out. We've got to stay in our lanes. I don't know why that water stain is there. I know there's a water stain and that's what I disclosed. Failure to treat material facts properly, failure to disclose will result, may result disciplinary action from the real estate commission. Uh, real quick, I got a question come in. Can the buyer get a home inspection? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, buyers are encouraged to get home inspections. We will talk about the buyer's process. Uh, when we get in that unit 21, we'll have the buyer's process and the things that they can do. And absolutely, a home inspection is one of them. So when it comes to mishandling material facts, the Real Estate Commission gives us prohibited conducts. There's prohibited conducts revolved around material facts. And before we look at our book, let's go out of the book for just a second. We're gonna back up for one second and we're first just gonna define some words. And once we define some words, then we're gonna do a mashup and talk about our prohibited conduct. So let's just first back up and define some words. A misrepresentation is communicating false information. I don't know another way to put this other than to tell you guys a misrepresentation is a lie. You opened your mouth and a lie fell out. Maybe you did it verbally. Maybe you did it on the phone, in person. Maybe you did it via text or an email. Maybe you lied on your um, advertising. Somehow you communicated false information. Somehow, you got a lie out there to the public. The opposite of that is omitting it. If you omitted it, you kept your mouth shut. You didn't disclose it. You didn't tell potential buyers. So the problem with the Real Estate Commission, they have a problem when you either lie or you omit. Our acts can be either done willfully, you did it intentionally, you're lying and you know darn well you were lying. You kept your mouth shut and you knew, but you just kept your mouth shut. You did that with knowledge. You did it intentionally, you did it willfully. 
acts can also be done negligently. You didn't mean to, but it still happened. You didn't mean to lie. You didn't mean to omit, but it still happened. So willful is intentional. Negligent is unintentional. And now that we've defined some words, we're going to do a mashup. And the bottom of page 143, we're looking at our prohibited conducts. Failure to properly disclose a material fact may result in disciplinary action from the Real Estate Commission about one of these prohibited conducts. I often refer to these as the big four. So what am I telling you? When it comes to material facts, if you lie about it, you could face disciplinary action. If you omit it, you could face disciplinary action. I don't know if you will or not, I'm not the real estate commission. They're gonna have to be the ones that determine if you did it willfully or negligently. What I'm telling you is don't lie and don't omit. So we're going to talk about each of these. So first off, we have willful misrepresentation. The broker has actual knowledge. They know. And they deliberately misinform. Willful misrepresentation says you know and you lie. You know the roof leaked. You know there was a water stain there before you listed the house. Buyer comes in and says, are there any problems with the roof? And you say, huh-uh. You know there's a problem. Just because you covered it up or your seller covered it up with paint does not make it go away. You know you asked, you are asked, and you lied. So we'll look at an example. A seller's agent is aware that the present owner of the listed property had serious problems with electrical wiring. Nonetheless, the broker tells a prospective purchaser that all mechanical systems are in excellent condition. That broker is guilty of willful misrepresentation. They know, doesn't matter how they know, they know and then they lie. They know there's a problem with the electrical. Buyer comes in and says, everything good? You say, yep, good to go. Willful misrepresentation. There are additional examples in your book uh, on page 144. When it comes to breaking down the big four, I think the examples are helpful because I think the examples help take these and make them real. They put them in scenarios. When you see these on your test, you're probably gonna see a scenario and it's gonna ask you, was this a misrepresentation? Was this omission? So I think in addition to studying the definition, of course, but I also think the examples help get us that information, helps wrap our brains around it. So willful misrepresentation. You're aware, you know, you have knowledge and you lie. Negligent misrepresentation is still a lie, but it was done unintentionally. Maybe the agent doesn't know. Maybe they were given incorrect information to begin with. Maybe they made a mistake. Do y'all ever make a mistake? Boy, I'll put my hand up first. I do often, every day, all day. That's how I live my life. We're human, right? We make mistakes. Do mistakes happen? Yes. If you find out you made a mistake, fix it. If you find out after you list a property that you had wrong information in, update your listing. If you had conversations with buyers prior to learning that, interested buyers, call them and tell them, fix the mistake. Even though it was unintentional, even though you didn't mean for it to happen, the fact remains that it still did. The fact remains that you still got the wrong information out there. 
Uh, question comes in, when dealing with sellers, is fresh paint on the walls or ceiling a red flag? And that's a great question. Um, a lot of times people will paint before they list. Um, you know, I, isn't it amazing what a fresh coat of paint can do? just kind of changes everything, right? Fresh coat of paint. So, you know, you may want to make a, I don't know if I would have a red flag go up. I guess I would just kind of be like, oh, wow, you guys just painted, you know. Um, I don't know that I would hound, why'd you paint? Why'd you, are you hiding something? You, you, you with me? Unless they give me reason to believe. Unless they give me reason to believe. But I would ask questions. What else am I going to ask the seller if I find out they painted yesterday before I got there? Don't I want to make sure they paid the painters? Don't I want to worry about mechanics liens being put on the property? So yeah, when you see fresh paint, maybe you do have a little flag go up. Just, just ask some questions. Any negligent act, again, is done intentionally. And I think this is so important that we get. You didn't mean to, but it still happened. So any negligent act, the Real Estate Commission is going to perform what's known as the reasonable standards test. And with a negligent act, they're going to stop and ask themselves when a reasonably prudent broker in this situation could have found out. Could they have asked some questions? Could they have investigated? Could they have dug a little deeper to find out? Why don't you guys tell me in a chat? Willful is intentional, negligent is unintentional. Which one do you think, and you can count, tell me W or N, which one do you think is gonna get you in bigger trouble with the real estate commission? One that is done willfully or one that is done negligently? And you can tell me with a W or an N, and I love it, my chat's blown up right now, I love it. I agree with I agree with most of you. I think willful is going to get us in bigger trouble with the real estate commission because you did it and you know darn well you were doing it. The commission may question your character. They may question your intent. Negligent guys mistakes happens. Guess what? Our commissioners, they're human too. They've made mistakes. Mistakes happen. The real estate commission is going to be could you have found out? should you have found out. Do I have everybody? The reasonable standards test. So while viewing a property in a subdivision, the buyer tells their agent they wanna build a large storage building in the backyard and asks if that would be okay. Buyer's agent calls the listing agent and is told everybody else in the subdivision has a storage building, so I'm sure your buyer can as well. Nobody checks the covenants. Nobody gets a copy of those into the buyer's hands. Guess what? Both agents could go down for negligent misrepresentation. Could the buyer's agent have found out? Could the buyer's agent have gotten their hands on those restrictive covenants? Yes. Did the listing agent do wrong by answering without knowing how she's, yeah, sure, everybody else does it, so I'm sure you can too. Both agents could, I'm not saying they are, I'm not the real estate commission. Both agents could go down because both agents could have found out before they responded. Again, more examples of negligent misrepresentation, page 145. I like the examples. I think they help. So misrepresentation is a lot. Whether you meant to or not, you still got the wrong information out there. Then we have willful omission. The licensee knows they have actual knowledge of a material fact. We have a duty to disclose, but you don't. You kept your mouth shut. You know of a zoning change, but you don't tell potential buyers. You know and you kept your mouth shut. You did it intentionally. When it comes to omission or willful omission, this isn't a case of 
Well, they never asked, so I didn't know I had to disclose. Just because the buyer doesn't walk in the front door and say, are there any zoning changes? Is in and out for me. Once I know of a material fact, I always have a duty to disclose. I don't wait for them to ask me. If I do, if I know and I don't disclose, if I know and I keep my mouth shut, I have engaged, I may be guilty of willful omission. A seller's agent is aware that the listed property has suffered extensive termite damage. It's not easily detectable. Maybe it's in the far deep dark corner of the crawl space. So when you poke your head out in the crawl space, in, your, in the crawl space, uh, you can't see the deep dark corner. It's still there though. And somehow that agent knew about it. Maybe the seller told them, maybe they got down there in the flashlight and they saw it. Somehow they were aware that there was termite damage that's not easily detectable. Regardless of whether a prospective purchaser actually inquires about possible termite damage or not, the broker still has a duty to disclose. So in other words, you don't have to wait for somebody to show up and say, y'all got any termite damage in this home? Once you know, you have to disclose. Don't wait for them to ask. Failure to disclose would be an omission. And if you know, if you're aware, it would be a willful omission. You did it on purpose. You intentionally kept your mouth shut. Examples of willful omission are on page 145. And then the last of the big four, is that right? Yeah, the last of the big four is negligent omission. The licensee does not have actual knowledge, but they should have reasonably known. Here's our reasonable standards test. Could I have asked? Could I have found out? Could I have investigated? Can I go to the city of Winston-Salem's website and see if there's any zoning amendments on the table? Any proposed zoning changes? Yeah. Can I go to DOT's website and see if there's any planned highway construction in the next few years? Yeah. We're doing this research. We're helping our buyers and sellers get the information. Remember, we are fact finders. We're not just going to look at our buyers and say, oh, good, you want to buy a house. Go out there and find. Guys, we're going through this with them. We're assisting them in this process. That's why they hired me. Buyers may not know to go check zoning and DOT and all this other good stuff. That's why I'm getting paid the big bucks. Negligent omission. You didn't disclose, but you should have known. You could have found out. Again, reasonable standard test. The real estate commission is going to ask, could you have found out? So a broker is viewing a home in February to list. The house is unusually cold, but the broker does not ask about the heat or it's about its condition. Come to find out that heat pump is inoperable. This buyer buys obviously choosing not to get a home inspection is not required. They were never informed and they never find out that the heat pump doesn't work. The agent could be guilty of negligent omission because they could, if you're sitting in your listing appointment in February and you still have your coat and your gloves and your scarf and your hat on, it's cold in here, would that put up a little flag to ask some questions? Did your red flag go up? And the real estate commission is going to ask, why did you sit there in you know, the cold and not ask questions? That's what we're looking for, for these little red flags. Is the little red flag gonna lead me anywhere? I don't know, but at least I can verify that I asked. At least we can say, you know, I had questions, I found out. Let's say for example, um, you're at a listing appointment and you're going through the home with the sellers and you're getting the information you need to list the property. And you and your sellers walk in the kitchen and of course you see a stove and a built-in microwave and you know, da, da, da. And you say, are all the appliances in your kitchen in good working order? Is that a fair question to ask a seller? Is everything that's gonna convey, is it, does it work? And the seller says, yeah, 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 it works just fine. 
guys, I'm not going to say, well, I'll be the judge of that and run over and turn the oven on and make sure that the burners work right. If I don't have a flag go up, I have no reason to question what they told me. Now, what if the oven door is hanging on by a hinge? Don't I have a little flag that goes up that maybe the oven's not working the way it should? You guys see what I'm saying? So when the seller says it works, I'm not going to say, well, we'll see about that. But if I have a flag go up, if I have a reason to suspect what that flag means is, Julie, you have to investigate further. You've got to ask some questions. We got to pay attention to those little red flags. What does your gut tell you? If the oven door is hanging by on by a hinge, my gut said, I'm not an oven expert, but I know the oven in my kitchen, the door securely closes. We've got to look out for those little red flags. Examples of negligent omission um, over on page 146. I do want to, uh, don't go anywhere. I got just a few more minutes. PowerPoint wise, I'm gonna end here today. So we'll pick back up uh, where we left off on Tuesday. Remember guys, we only have class on Tuesday next week, one day next week. Everybody good? So come see me Tuesday uh, and then we get Thursday off. So I do wanna point out now that we are, of course we looked at the syllabus and the various links in the syllabus that'll direct us to the license law and commission rule. But I also wanna show you guys and learn test pass under the welcome section. I actually have the North Carolina license law and commission rule. This is the current license law and commission rule. Everybody, please listen to me. Appendix A in your textbook is license law and commission rule. But Appendix A in your textbook is out of date. I don't know when your book was printed, but I know the current license law and commission rule was just this past July. So yes, you have this in your book, but what's in your book is old. I will share with you guys the applicable license law and commission rules that you need to know. Of this booklet, what I wanna point out, if we scroll down, starting, and y'all please write this down. In this booklet, starting on page 106, there's a license law and rule comments. One of the last things we do in this class is the specific state specific stuff. And a big chunk of that revolves around this license law and rules comments. I would like you guys to start reading this now. I don't need you to read this whole thing. I've got you covered. I do want you guys to read the comments that start on page 106. Have you ever sat down and tried to read law before? Have you ever sat down and tried to read rule before? Boring. Please don't try to do it in one setting. When it comes to getting through this stuff, I highly recommend that you break it up into sections. 10 minutes of study time, page at a time, something like this. This is not an easy read, but it's important. Particularly, Within the license law and commission rule comments, if we scroll down, starting on page 109, it talks to us again about the material facts. And it also gives us the prohibited conducts. So here's our willful misrepresentation, for example. And guess what? They provide us with additional examples. So not only are we going to talk about it right now in unit seven, but we're going to talk about it again when we get to our state section at the end, license law and commission rule. What does that mean to you if I'm telling you I got it in two sources for you and we're going to talk about it two different times? Is it kind of sort of important? Yes. I don't expect you guys again to read this in one second. Have y'all ever heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant? Have y'all ever heard that? How do you eat an elephant? How does the answer to that, what'd you say? Uh, how does an ant eat an elephant? How does an ant eat an elephant? How does an ant eat an elephant? One bite at a time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is your elephant. I encourage you to break it down into sections. Start with the material facts and the willful or misrepresentation omission, if you'd like. Start again, the whole thing starts on 106. The comments are where I want you guys to focus in this entire 128 page booklet. I want you to start on page 106. Is that fair? I didn't ask you to read the whole thing. I asked you to start on page 106. Can you guys give me that? Or better yet, can you guys give yourselves that? I'm not the one that has to pass this test. I've already done that. Okay. The other thing I want to point out, if we look at the unit seven material, um, let's see, here's our meth letter. If you want to know all about that. The other thing I have in here, our continuing education class this year, our CE class this year, it's amazing to me how many pre-licensing topics pop up in CE. And you know what one of our CE topics is this year? Material facts. So I took, this is what agents that are currently licensed in the state, this is the education they're getting this year from the Real Estate Commission. So I didn't give you the whole section, but what I did do is I gave you the summary of important points. I'm sorry, that's agency. I, yeah, yep, yep. I have material facts in here as well. So the two big topics this year are agency and material facts. And I have both of those in Learn Test Pass, the unit seven material as well. Please be utilizing Learn Test Pass. Again, you guys, I'm a firm believer. The many different ways you can expose yourself to this information, the easier it's gonna to be to grasp, the better you are to wrap your brain around this. I've said a lot today, haven't I? How many of us are gonna spend time in unit seven this weekend? Perfect. Y'all have a great weekend. Please don't hesitate to let me know if there's anything I can do to help. I will see everybody at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. Bye, thank you, Julie. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Find, Thank you. Have fun this weekend too. <laughs> Don't spend all your weekend studying. Have fun. I'll try to have fun. It's my birthday weekend. <gasps> Yay! Oh. Happy birthday! Happy Thank birthday. you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I don't all know right. why it's just a weekend. Why don't you celebrate all month? That's the way I roll. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Happy birthday. Bye. Thank you.